cloud. You guys will probably all have to go and acknowledge that this is being recorded. And uh, that means that you're okay if this is shared, whatever your comments are during this, um, your image that might pop up if you make a comment, um, you're just agreeing that that's okay if we share that on YouTube and social media down the road. So welcome everyone to day two. I wanna thank our sponsors as we start off. Um, Jamin Day is our loan officer with Rabo Bank. Um, he has been a great person to work with and I completely endorse and recommend him. He works regionally, but if you're somewhere else in the uh, part of the United States and even internationally, Rabo is an international bank founded, I think in Holland over a century ago. I wish Jamin could be on, but he's at some potato expo somewhere in the world, I think in Denver, Colorado. So he's uh, spreading the message of regeneration with potato farmers. They need it more than anybody. So again, type, well, let, before we do that, let's not get too distracted. Um, uh, if a sparrow cannot fall without God recognizing it, then uh, I don't think we can do an effective summit without his help. And so I've asked um, William DeMille if he would give us a prayer to start this summit today. So go ahead, if you would, William, and unmute and and let's start with prayer. Okay, thank you, Jared. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee this day to learn about agriculture and soil health and how to make the world greener and more beautiful. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn from people who have spent their lives learning the things that that would have them know. We ask thee to bless the speakers this day, that thy Holy Spirit may be with them, that we may all be able to hear and learn the things that will help us to have success in our businesses and to be able to provide nutritious food for humanity. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, William. We sure appreciate that prayer. And um, yes, that is our goal is to share the message of truth and regeneration. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and get some, those of you who've just jumped on, same, same spiel as yesterday. Type in where you're from. We just want to have an, an idea of what part of the world you come from. So in the chat, hopefully everybody's familiar with the chat. Um, on a phone, it's a little bit different. On a laptop or computer, it should be at the top or bottom of your screen. Um, one thing that I like to do when, I, when I'm involved in a summit, usually I will, um, I will keep a Word document open. And that's where I take notes. Um, if you want to take notes on something else, that certainly works. But I will move my Zoom screen to one side and I'll keep my Word document or a Google Sheet, Google Doc on the other side. And then <clears throat> if somebody shares a slide that I like, I'll take a screenshot of that and you can drag it up into your Word document. And it's a very effective way for me to be able to capture more of what's being shared. So that's just a suggestion. Don't have to do it, but um, uh, you know, we want you to be able to get as much as you can out of here. Bogota, Colombia, Denial, Nevada, Chile, bienvenido, Southern Chile. Wow. Um, I did not know that we had anybody from Chile, Hawaii, Indiana, Wyoming, Oregon, Hawaii. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for coming, and more to come. Okay. So as we go through here, before I turn the slide over to Steve, did you have a comment before while we're going here, Steve? Let's, um... I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, when. just tell me when to hit my screen share so things go. Okay. okay. Yep, I'm, I'll stop sharing. As soon as I stop sharing screen, you go ahead and jump in and share. So um, this is interactive. Uh, take a minute and think about what your epiphany was from yesterday. So an epiphany is like an insight, your major takeaway. A sudden in, what is the what is the definition? A sudden insight, insight or intuitive understanding. I know there's other uh, definitions for it, but that's what we're going to use. So your big your big aha moment from yesterday. If you would just type that in the chat, it's good to learn. It's good to be reminded. Um, and so 
this will this will serve as a way to be able to teach each other. If we were in a group setting, I would pair you off in groups of threes and you'd teach each other, but this is the second best way to be able to do it. So, so everybody just kind of take time to scroll through what is being said. Good insights here. Thank you for sharing. Shiloh, Dorit, Jeremy, William, Joanne, this is the cyclical nature of history leadership yeah we talked a lot about leadership you guys didn't know we were again jumping into a leadership summit when you signed up did you um now i see that they say a good teacher um sells them what they want and delivers what they need we hope we're delivering what you need yeah give more thought to the fifty thousand dollar problem delegate the fifteen dollar an hour ones um good insight again we're just sharing our epiphany our big takeaway from understand from yes yesterday um this is help this is for your benefit and for everyone's benefit uh think back you know what are you going to do differently because you attended the class yesterday and for those who weren't on yesterday um this is an opportunity to be able to give them some insights and they're going to think dang i missed out how do i get that um, by the way, you can get that. I'm going to make it available for free for the attendees um, for one week. And so I'll send out an email with yesterday's recording. And then um, we are probably going to put it behind a pay window just to, uh, you know, you guys stayed in time to be here. Other people um, to honor the value of the message that is being shared. We're going to ask that they pay and you guys will get a 50% discount of what we're. So it'll be a $97 for people who didn't get on or register and 47 for those of you who did um leaving your comfort zone yeah all right so hopefully you all kind of remembered what it was yesterday and the feelings that were felt those insights that you had um let's just remind ourselves of what the ground rules are everybody remember these <clears throat> ask you to be present I realize that some of you might be multitasking and do the best that you can. Um, try to turn off notifications and there will be rewards for those who keep their cameras on. We've got trollers out there that are monitoring. You never know when they're going to jump on and see who is on and who's participating. And so at the end um, of this presentation, we've got some pretty awesome prizes that will be drawn out of the hat uh, for those who have participated and and so that's part of being present is just you know playing full out um being that's part of all of it respect uh respect yeah try to try to stay muted um certainly if you need to unmute if you need to ask a question we welcome that um type your questions in the chat keep it clean we're doing our best to keep this g-rated um 100 commitment where you're going to get that out of the presenters today and we ask that you be able to give 100%, whatever that looks like for you, even if it is driving in a tractor feeding cows, that you do your best to be to uh, abide by these rules. So how to turn your camera on? Um, let's see. So if you go up to the top, uh, actually, I'll, I'll message you, Clark, and we can walk through that. So it's the bottom left, usually on your screen, if you scroll your cursor down to the bottom left of your screen, there should be where you can unmute yourself or start your video. Okay. So for everybody who doesn't know, that's my wife, Selena. She is my back office help and uh, support, not only in this event, but normally we're side by side, as William alluded to yesterday in the introduction, but she's working behind the scenes as um are a couple of other people as well. So I realize if you're gonna do something effectively, you've gotta have a team. That's my epiphany for yesterday. Build a team. Don't try to don't try to be the solopreneur and get it all done because it's not always as effective. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And uh, okay, Steve, you can go ahead and share your screen while I'm introducing you. Again, for those, um, we we had a little bit of a change up. You probably saw in the email. Um, all things work out for a reason. 
and we uh, we know that this is going to be the best that it can be today. Um, even if it doesn't look perfect from the outset, those who are coming to present are the people that need to be here today. So um, we will go a little bit over time. I realize you know we represented this three hours, um, but to be able to fit the speakers in and our guest speaker. Um, it, it will probably go about half an hour over time. I completely respect if you need to jump off. And again, this will be recorded. So um, uh, don't use that as an excuse not to be present, but if you need to leave, certainly certainly that's permissible. Steve Campbell, um, I have, uh, oh, I don't know. We've known each other for nearly a decade. Um, years ago, I went to Wally Olson's ranch in Benito, Oklahoma to hear Gerald Fry speak. And I thought, just as I did with Bud Williams, somebody needs to go and learn from this person so that they can carry on this knowledge and the tradition that he has spent his life accumulating. And Steve Campbell is that man who has done that. Um, if you haven't read Gerald Fry's book, it's great. Uh, Gerald Fry, will talk about him during Steve's presentation, but um, he learned from other people bondsman and others and so gerald is um he's somewhat of a legend and i'm so appreciative that steve campbell has car carrying on his knowledge he's come to our ranch he's been gracious enough to do um, previous presentations in person and on zoom and they are always very well received um, he is in the cattle business he's marketed produced grass-fed beef he knows how to grow great grass um, he's the real deal when it comes to livestock selection and the right genotype, the right phenotype to be able to make um, cattle pay in your operation. And so it's a privilege to have Steve Campbell on here. I'll let you take it from here, Steve. Well, Jared, thank you very much. And and uh, I appreciate everybody who's tuned in today. I have, I would putting this PowerPoint together, and I see I, I didn't spell check good enough, putting an old head on young shoulders. Anyway, Chip Hines is, has written three or four books, uh, and he's the one that uh, came up with that. Well, in this case, not necessarily everyone has uh, young shoulders, but inquiring shoulders. Uh, how do we do regeneration better? And um, I'm gonna tell a little story here about Lou Holtz, and, and I'm not saying I'm Lou Holtz, but I like the story. Um, he gave the commencement speech at the Franciscan University in either 2015 or 16. And when the applause died down, he asked what the average age was and kind of came up with 23. And Lou said, I'm 78. And there's a few giggles and whatnot. He says, I've been 23. You've never been 78. Now listen up. Well, uh, with Jared and Alan yesterday and Cam and those coming up tomorrow, there's some people that have done work in this field for a long time. And um, hopefully our message will help you pick and choose what will work in, in your area. There's a book and uh, Cam will probably appreciate this maybe more than others, but uh, building your story brand. And uh, if you're gonna direct market, that's a very good book to, to read. Thinking about uh, Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, the character here on the, on the left, he has a problem and he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi who helps him figure out what he needs to do, which then he has to go do, that results either in failure or success. And uh, I guess to put, today's or, or these three days worth of uh, thought into that all of you here today I guess you feel you have a problem you want to know more about regeneration and profit so the guides would tend to be the six speakers but you'll you'll meet other people on here I think you have some way someone was going to explain how we could uh, personally text back and forth between people that might be from Wyoming. Hey, there's more people in Wyoming or here's a group in Colorado. It, if there's a way, uh, Selena and Jared, for you folks to um, put that together, 
if people uh, give permission for their info. Uh, there'll be like-minded people in your area that you can then bounce these ideas off of. So a plan, well, there's six different talks here. What are you gonna do when you get home and will that help us avoid failure in the future? As somebody said, know what you know, know what you don't know and know who knows what you don't know. So this growth in carcass traits is what industry talks about, but on the ranch, that's only 20% and 10% of our profit. We've had a lot of cows go to town out west in the last couple of years um, because I, I'm going to suggest we were we were producing cows that produced the growth and carcass traits the feedlot was looking for. But I want to question everyone or challenge everyone: Are those the ones that wound up getting pregnant and staying fat in the last two years? So this is from Michael McDonald. He was a linear measurer from, oh golly, the 70s, 80s, 90s. I think he just, well, for, for 45 years he did this. And, and analyzing the numbers, 40% of fertility, uh, or 40% of the profit on the ranch is fertility in a cow. Does she have a calf every year? Glandular function, sheds early in the spring. The, I can't believe I don't have a solo cup. Hang on one second here. Got to dump my water. Normally, I actually have a red solo cup with me, but if the cow's head is on this end, she's getting deeper as she goes back. She's getting taller as she goes back. That shape <clears throat> kind of works everywhere and a little more on that. And then butterfat indicators, and there will be more on that. 30% of the profit on the ranch is maintenance cost to the cow. And uh, some cows eat twice as much as others, even though they might weigh the same. The, the main drivers of maintenance costs are the big belly and, and butter fat. Butter fat is kind of more than free and I'll get into that. And the other one for maintenance cost is these different grazing stockpiling programs get the hay out like we, heard yesterday, Jim Garish wrote the book, but um, different ways of doing this. Oh, and I want to stop right here. I'm not going to read every line that's on here. And if if I don't explain something too good, I, I have all this up here and sometimes I don't connect the dots for people. Put your hand up. We can go back a slide or two to make sure that you understand what I'm trying to say today. So 70% of the profit on the ranch is fertility and maintenance cost. Now, Cam's going to talk about uh, direct marketing. Well, you want carcass traits. You, you want some growth, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use growth in a different fashion. You'll see a rib angle thing we'll talk about in a while. So these coal miners are wondering why this canary died. And um, our great granddads used to know a lot of what I'm about to talk about. Um, uh oh, I gotta I gotta escape here. Give me one second. Um, gotta go back. Like I say, I was just uh, putting this together. So cows digest forty to seventy percent of what they ingest. This is from Anibal Portomingo. He got his PhD at New Mexico State in, I believe it was 95, and the average beef cow in the US digested 55% of what she ingested. Then he heard Gerald Fry talk. He went back and found that there were some cows that were digesting 70% of what they ingested. Well, to average 40, I mean, to average 55, some were only digesting 40. If, if my right foot is in boiling water, my left foot is in a block of ice, my average temperature is 120. But that doesn't tell the story. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Um, Don Faulkner, Arizona, Arizona State, I think in 
2013 said we're getting really good at predicting a percent of body weight of a group of dry cows or yearlings or calves depending on what we're feeding them but what we can't tell you is what individuals in those groups are eating some animals are eating twice as much as others so if, if the group is averaging three percent of body weight some cows are consuming four percent of their body weight those cows look like this no guts okay heads over here some cows are consuming two percent of body weight the ones with big guts now it's not just about big guts but we're on that in a little bit so we need to develop the kind of cow that'll do the very best with the grass that you've got and as you graze better um, we'll have better grass and I won't get into this other supplement thing, but you know we're we're asking a cow to calve every twelve months enough butter fat to raise it growth. Hopefully, only on what we have. We don't want to be buying grain, anything like that. We supplemental feeding versus substitute feeding. Substitute feeding just costs. Supplements to get the minerals that we need, get the neighbors' toxins out to add more digestion. Um, I'm gonna be going through this. I'm gonna say, here's the right kind of cow and here's the wrong kind of cow. Any one cow can make a liar out of you. But in general, the ones with their bigger bellies are the easier keeping ones. Now, I'm gonna point it out later on, but there's the, the angle of the last rib is fairly important in whether she will or won't breed back. Hi, so, Steve. Yes. <clears throat> um... So Justin asked a really good question here. Um, so would two animals digesting 40% actually ingest about the same as an animal uh, di digesting 70%? So I think what, what we're understand digesting, what about ingesting? You're saying, uh, explain that. It, if, I, if I may, they digest 40% of what they ingest. 60% goes out the back end. They, they couldn't digest it down. They couldn't get that particle length in the manure down to quarter or three eighths of an inch in length. Where those with a big gut, the cow's shaped more like this, they, they digest more out of everything that they ingest. So they eat less, they lay down, they chew their cud more. Did I, did I get to the end of that question? I'm happy to talk more about that, but. I yeah, mean, I think that. I think that's it. So bottom line, they do eat less because they need less because they're more efficient. Uh, a different way to say it is the group is averaging 30 pounds per head per day. Okay. And 70 and 40 are almost some animals are eating twice as much as others. So I'm just going to use the twice as much as others uh, for sake of example. That means some of some animals for them to average 30, some animals are eating 40 pounds of of feed a day and some are getting by on 20 pounds of feed a day okay okay that's really good one more housekeeping thing then i'll let you get on if you guys know how to change your name in zoom or somebody can walk through on the chat how to do that that would be awesome um again this uh, is just for um, prizes at the end so if you can know how to go in there and change from your phone number to your name that would be super super helpful for us thanks steve you're you're welcome and great question great question <laughs> i uh trying to be a little bit in a hurry because i have a lot prepared but that that was an excellent question so you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink um thinking about a loaded cement truck and you're driving down, you're behind him, you're driving down the road and, and that barrel is spinning clockwise. They're slinging the, the, the cement up the left side of that barrel. Loaded cement trucks turn better to the left than they do to the right because the, the center of gravity is on the inside of the turn when you're turning left. I just want you to turn your head on in this kind of thinking today, common sense, in what we're about to get into, okay? So 
everything else being equal. I'm going to talk about vertical folds or uh, anti-fertility bone or different things. I'm leaving the rest of the cow alone, and I'm only going to talk about where the adrenal hair whorl is. Well, some things are really important. Some things are much less important, okay? Um, every zip code is different. It depends, it depends, it depends. Um, that, I, I don't know how many times I've said that. Some people call it context. Nature always bats last. We can do EPDs and all this other stuff, but nature's actually going to tell you what works on your place. And then epigenetics, we need more minerals and fewer toxins virtually everywhere, unless you're Gabe Brown. Um, and so that's a whole different talk. Um, but hide, hair, bone, and butter fat are the main things I want to cover here today. So we've been told by the slick magazines that, hey, we need this kind of a steer in the feedlot. But then we have to suffer through their sisters as cows at home. And I'm going to challenge you to think back, those of you out west who have had to reduce the size of your herd because you ran out of grass, which were the cows that came up open? And is the frame score of your cow herd shorter now than it was two years ago before we ran out of grass? And then my big deal is I want something that's natural, it works and doesn't cost a lot of money. I want the money staying in your back pocket. So here's Jared on the phone telling uh, Billy Crystal and City Slickers the, uh, the animal that he wants him to pick out of this herd. And uh, he has no idea what any of these words are because he's never been in a herd of cows before in his life. Um, quite a bit of what I might want to say or do say here today is gonna, maybe going to sound a little bit like that, but bear with me if you will. Um, so this is right out of uh, either Man Must Measure or can you read it? The Bonsma Lectures. And you can go online and download uh, the PDF of uh, Man Must Measure. Could, could you read that, Jared? Was that? You're muted. Anyway, um, so you can see these lines going back and forth. And the pituitary and the testes and the ovaries are all developed at approximately the same time in utero. Um, well, the um, estrogen, no, I got to back up. Sex hormones shut off long bone growth in the cow. The shorter an animal in any breed, the more sex hormones they're producing. We've produce long, tall steers in the feedlot. Well, now we have long, tall cows. More efficient cows are shorter and estrogen shuts off long bone growth in the front end of the cow. So everything else being equal, the cow that looks like she's walking downhill here on level ground is more fertile than a cow that would be flat on top and look just like her, but she's flat. The one walking downhill is more fertile, everything else being equal. Again, pituitary and testes and ovaries are all developed at the same time. If you wind up with a scar running up and down the forehead apart, that's a little less fertility in that animal. I certainly wouldn't use the bull, and if you had James Drayson's herd bull fertility looking at the hair standing on the pole, a period of low or no fertility. This cow, she might do all right, but I certainly wouldn't keep a bull or a heifer, but she might give you a pretty good calf. But especially if you're in any kind of a uh, seed stock operation, don't. Now you, you might get by with it if you're crossbreeding or outcrossing and it wouldn't show up. But if you're trying to a purebred deal, I would not keep that cow as a purebred cow, okay? So just different things to look at. Testosterone shuts off long bone growth in the back of the bull first. So, so the bull's head's on the front end. Estrogen shuts it off in the front end of the cow. 
So I'm trying to indicate that. Now that's cheating a little bit in those two photographs because the bull is standing on a slight incline and the cow is standing on a little bit of a decline. I guess that'd be the right term. But I just want you to get the idea, a more fertile bull is walking uphill, everything else being equal. And of course on this bull, you see the darker here on the front half and the lower half, more testosterone. What I really wish was this last rib, was more straight up and down, more about that in a little bit. On the cow, we want the last rib angled somewhere between the hock and the ankle. That's, that's what we want, more on that in a little bit. <clears throat> so the pull of the breed, as in we're wanting these taller, longer animals in the feedlot. So to get that, we wind up with, with sisters that look like this now this is actually a pretty good cow she's got a pointed pole vertical folds shoulder blades are about even with the backbone slope of the last ribs good her anti-fertility bone doesn't really stick up back here bald at her she's actually got a quite nice rear cannon bone that little divot right there anyway the problem with this cow is she's walking uphill she she could be more fertile than she is when things get real tough she's going to last a long time and again any one cow can make a liar out of you am i going to send this one down the road absolutely not but she may not make it to 10 or 11 calves in a row without skipping if she if that same cow were an inch and a half shorter in the shoulders she probably would make it so we need to select and breed for fertility adaptability, maintenance cost, epigenetics, if you haven't heard the term air, water, grass, the mineral stockmanship, uh, toxins blowing in, uh, weather, that sort of thing. If we don't have that, and that's a whole different talk, um, we're gonna have to add some sea minerals. Uh, it, I'm gonna just go here for a second. Virtually every mixed mineral, with very few exceptions, get the individual ingredients out of China and almost every individual ingredient, zinc sulfate, copper sulfate, manganese, coming from China has cadmium in it. There'll be a picture of a cadmium hump here. Uh, we keep getting these mixed minerals with more and more selenium. Well, the first thing selenium is gonna do is detoxify lead, mercury, and cadmium. Okay, I'll, I'll get off of that. Um, so we can see a lot of different things on the outside of the cow. This is a pretty nice shaped rump on this cow. If you can see this little ridge here, this is along the ribs on the side of the cow and the hair from the top is coming down from the bottom, it's coming up and it, it comes in this little wave, like you can see over here. That is glandular hormonal function. The more of that you see in your cows on the back leg, on the side, shoulder, whatever, the better. Okay. I don't, I'm not talking about where she might have licked herself down here. You know, it's this little wine right here. That's 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 glandular function. You want to see that in your animals. So the early hair shedders, the ones in the spring of the year when it first starts warming up, those that tend to shed their hair the first will be the ones that tend to breed the first. That's 40% of your profit is having a calf every year. In the fall of the year, the ones that tend to start to frizz out as it gets colder, those cows are probably the same ones that shed the earliest in the spring. They're the most in tune with their environment. Every time you move a cow, it could be a horse, it could be a sheep, whatever. Every time you move an animal, I mean, this is Fred Provenza. Um, why can't I say it? What's his book, Jared? Um, Nourishment, Nourishment by Fred Provenza. Every time you move an animal, there will be a cost. The better your environment, the easier that cost is, uh, the lower that cost is, I should say. So as we heard yesterday, I guess in Alan's talk at 90 degrees, uh, bare dirt is, uh, a hunt, the dirt's 140 degrees. Well, 
on the back of a black cow, it's 140 on the red cow, 118 and the white cow, 112. If you don't have shade and you live in the deep south and you have black cow, you're probably gonna have more opens than if you had red or white if everything else was equal. So the cow on the left, that rounded in tail, um, you, you can see this, I mean, in the slope from here down, which is great, um, handy dandy pelvis, I gotta get back farther. The more slope there is from the hooks down to the pins, the bigger that pelvic opening looks. The less slope there is, the harder it is to get the calf out. And uh, so the one on the right, the one on the right here, her tail, let's see, I gotta go back. Her tail comes out and then hangs straight down. That is less butter fat. Butter fat is more than free. It, it costs nothing to select cows for butter fat. They, they are gonna be your easy keepers. Um, so the broom tail, when I was a kid, all I heard when this guy said it was a broom tail cow. There's a, there's a image coming up here later on. And then I finally went, oh, it's a broom handled tail cow. For years and years and years, sex hormones shut off long bone growth. Sex hormones shut off all bone growth. Small diameter tail, fine cannon bones, front and rear, pointed pole, that's all more sex hormones. Fertility, 40% of your profit. So uh, anti-fertility bone, back to this <clears throat> pelvis. A lot of people will have a, I got to back up here. Have cows with fairly flat from hooks to pins. And then the tail process comes up like this and goes back. That I call that the anti-fertility bone anymore. I heard Gerald call it the grow bone. And I'm like, oh yeah, we need some growth. Water off a duck's back. If you're selecting cows that have a raised tail process, you are selecting lower fertility cows. So a number of different things that we'll talk about here on the outside, but, but what I really wanna show on this cow, and I wish I hadn't cut off the top of her head here. Can you guys see, Jared, my, my cursor that I'm trying to point with? Is that showing up? I think you're- uh, Yep, you're it muted. is. You're, okay. No, okay. yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Okay. So the the thymus. I mean, after the shiny hair coat, that's the first thing that gets me to look at an animal, is the uniform shiny hair coat in the summer or the velveteen rabbit all frizzed out the same in the winter. So the second thing is going to be how big is this thymus, and it's this hair inside this area right here. This is all running uphill. Everywhere else, the hair is running down. Well, in the back, there's another thing. But anyway, this is, this is all running uphill. The larger that is, the, the more in tune with her environment, the healthier the animal. That will be a little smaller in the winter, tougher conditions, drier feed. It'll be a little bigger in the summer on that cow. So here's just another one, a little bit different shape, but again, a great big thymus presentation. And another one, great big. It's harder to see this in the fall, in the winter, than it is in the spring, summer. Um, but you go look at your herd and just, <laughs> my mind's going too many different places. I better stick with what I've got going here. <clears throat> anyway, uh, look at your cows this winter and, and they'll be a little harder to see. But when you get, when it, uh, what, May, June, Start looking at the size of the thymus and everything else being equal, the ones that tend to have the bigger thymus are gonna tend to be the better cows. Um, is it the biggest thing? No, but it's a thing. Uh, shed the earliest down their back. Okay, we have already heard that. So I'm gonna do a lot of different things on this cow. And then I'm gonna probably go talk about them individually after that. So on her, <clears throat> this, this thymus is, is maybe four inches across and 20 inches long, something like that. Um, she has an adrenal hair whorl. That would be the place where the, the hair is going 360 degrees 
And it usually you'll find it anywhere from about here to here. The further forward, the further forward, the better. But don't get too hung up on that. It's just a thing. The main thing that I want you to think about with this adrenal hair whorl is when a heifer first starts cycling, when she first starts producing estrogen, there'll be three, four, five hairs stand up in the middle of that adrenal hair whorl and they'll remain standing until three weeks or a month after she stops producing estrogen. She got pregnant and then the hair all lays down. In the, in the winter time, uh, think about taking a tennis ball and cutting about a third of it off. So now we've got just this little third of a tennis ball. I've seen cows that were real good glandular function. All their hair is frizzed out, but you could have just set that third of a tennis ball right on top of the adrenal hair whorl. That, that hair was just this little bowl there on their back. Estrogen causes it to stand up. Progesterone causes it to lay down. About five and a half, six months in, it takes estrogen to turn the calf and, and it'll, those hairs in that adrenal hair whorl will stand back up even though she's pregnant later on. A pointed pole, there was a book written in uh, 1868 by a veterinarian named Hewitt and he was the first one where I'd read about this and you want tender meat, it would go the same with uh, cannon bones. Um, but yeah, a pointed pole and butter fat, butter fat, tender meat. If I say either one, they both go together. Uh, the earlier in life, you see the stifle muscle. So we've got the, the hook, the pin, the hip socket, the stifle joint, the hock. The earlier in life, you see that stifle muscle, the more butter fat is in that animal, the more fertile that animal. So we're trying to pick, replacement heifers at three or four months of age. We're trying to pick bull calves out early on, which ones to consider. The bigger the stifle muscle, the better. The hook bone level with the backbone. So if the hook is level with the backbone, every time she takes a step, the hook bone was gonna be rocking up above the backbone as she, as she takes a step. That's what you want to see. Most cows, most cows, you're down an inch and a half to three inches below the backbone. I should have some place to leave this so I don't have to go. But if, if, if we've got pretty good slope, but all of a sudden, wait a minute, our hook bones are down three inches. What happened to our slope from hooks to pins? We lost it. So you want bulls. You want bulls whose hook bones are level with their backbone. If you, 90 plus percent of the places that I go, the biggest problem with the cows is what I call the anti-fertility bone sticking up. And if, if you wanna fix that, and it would be the nine out of 10 places I go, that is the problem to fix first. If you can find a bull who's got the right slope here, he's gonna fix other things about your cow herd. It, more things have to be right, but if you would only worry about that one thing, if that was your take home from this talk, getting rid of that anti-fertility bone sticking up behind the hooks, that, if that's all you concentrated on, the, I was successful today. So uh, what do we do there? So walking downhill on level ground, slope from hooks to pins, the more vertical folds there are in the hide, that means the hide is loose. The looser the hide, the more butter fat. The farther back those vertical folds go, the looser, the more butter fat you've got. And if you find a heifer calf or a cow that has vertical folds from the vulva down to the udder, they almost always, they almost always turn into really good cows. Um, Jared, are there any hands coming up or we just keep plowing on here? We're good? Uh, let's see. I was I was uh, disobeying house rules here and multitasking. <laughs> so, um, uh, hopefully you'll forgive me because I am admitting people and making sure that everybody knows how to get in. Okay. So 
Yep, we've got, um, can you see these attributes on a young bred heifer or only on cows? And then there's one other one after you answer that. Um, short answer, yes. The day a calf is born, um, stealing my own thunder here a little bit, but the width of the muzzle, you know, this duckbill look, the width of the muzzle is approximately equal to the width of the pin bones. And the pin bones are 80 to 90% as wide as the pelvic opening up here. So if we've got long skinny faces on heifers, don't keep them as a cow unless you really like pulling calves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is a book you can get online called The Milch Cow by Francois Guinon. It was written in the early 1800s. Uh, it's a PDF. You could download it. You can. I think they're reprinting it now. But... There's a hair pattern on the back. You can see the outline of that the, the day the calf is born. So you're going to know that that spade, the more up angle, you'll see more of this, but the, a bit of an up angle, more butter fat. Step on the down leg and top, pull the top one up. If you've got four teats and right around those, maybe the size of your palm is a lighter nappy your hair you're probably going to have a bald udder number one for butterfat a bald udder number one for butterfat but if she's got six teats two extra ones in the back that's even more butterfat um flat across the top of the shoulders and those hook bones up level with the backbone though that you could see that the day a calf's born and and the girls were versus the women. If you want to put it that way, they'll just they'll just be more and more pronounced. Um, I measured a lot of heifers when I first started. And once I learned how to cheat and add an inch and take an inch away in two different places, and, and it's not a secret, I was adding an inch to heart girth and taking one away from rump height. Uh, then, then my uh, selection criteria was higher, but when I first started, about 75 to 80% of them would continue right on with what they were, but some of them would take a left turn, a left turn, and, and didn't develop the way that I had hoped until I figured out how to kind of cheat with the, the numbers as a eight, nine-month-old calf. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Not only do we have bull calves following the bull around when they're in with the, the um, cows, there'll be some heifer calves, not nowhere near as many as, as bull calves. Um, I'll, I'll just go with that. I guess, did that, did I get the question answered there? You said there was a second question. Yeah, the second question is you gotta you gotta dig deep for this one. What about sheep? Um, maybe it's easy to see these qualities on hair sheep and wool sheep, but I assume linear measuring would have some validity across species. Um, so Burl Winchester, who used to teach at Montana State University, was giving a talk in Carney Redmond, Ken Redmond's granddad heard Burl talk about linear measuring sheep, went up and said, hey, could we adapt this to cows? Did you just hear that? They were linear measuring sheep before they were linear measuring cows. Anyway, Ken had just gotten out of high school. He was driving his granddad around who couldn't see real well. And Ken was the math whiz. And uh, Ken was responsible for, I don't know how many tens of thousands of animals that got measured. He hired people to go and measure, but, and I'll, I'll have some of his uh, graphs here in a little bit, but um, walking downhill wide, butt. I mean, the, the wider the butt, the easier the calving, the wider the butt, the, the better the fleshing ability, the bigger the belly, the, the better the digestion of whatever they're ingesting. More on that in a little bit. Did, did I get you there, uh, Jared? Yes. Short answer, yes. It, I can't tell you uh, glandular function on sheep, but the, yeah. the shape, the shape, yes. Mm -hmm. So kind of a, uh, another question or we're good? Okay. So kind of a pleasing face to me. And the, uh, from the bottom of the eye to the muzzle, versus to the top of the head, that's your proportion. 
if you are one and an eighth down here, they're too masculine. They're not as fertile. If you're one and three eighths down here or beyond that, they're higher maintenance. I'm gonna remove the line so everybody can kind of see that face. A nice face for a cow. Not too long, not too short, wide muzzle. She can eat enough for three, but she's got a wide pelvic opening, okay? <clears throat> and then the less of the bottom jaw you can see, the more fertile the cow. I don't know why I just picked that up here in the last year. And I don't remember where I read it, but it was one of those Bonsma or, or somebody like that. Uh, Carney, or I might have been Carney Redman. Uh, I don't want to shortchange somebody. So, <clears throat> okay, the, I just already said that. Um, yeah, and I already went through all of this. So narrow muzzles were pulling calves. So here's a here's a cow down in uh, Texas. Out of the whole herd, this was the only shiny one. She she didn't have the depth that I was looking for uh, here in the chest. I wish this whole bottom line had probably been down something like this. And I'll talk about this more later. But the fewer acres it takes to run a cow the further off the ground the chest can be. The more acres it takes, 50, 100, the, the closer to the ground that bottom line needs to be, but we always need this slope. Whether we're, whether we're two acres to the cow or we're 50, 60, 70 acres to the cow, we need a bigger belly than heart girth. And part of that has to do with, is this last rib angled back? They take better care of their calf than if these ribs are straight up and down. Well, if the ribs are straight up and down, she's deeper in the chest. So now we have a flat bottom line. Every once in a while, the boxcar cow works, but not real often. Well, I'll talk about meat to bone ratio in a little bit. But anyway, back to this cow. She's got a lot of vertical folds. Clear back here in the back end. She had a big stifle muscle. And the reason this intrigued me was she was so slight built. I was like, how in the world does she have that big of a stifle muscle? Well, if you look at her right rear leg, she pulled up there and turned off to the right. And, and she had that stifle joint pushed in against her, the back end. And that made the, the uh, stifle muscle stick out more than it should have for that cow. See what you are looking at. And so I would just like to eliminate all that anti-fertility bone on her. And I told the owner, I said, uh, I would use her daughter. It might be a grandson, but don't get rid of this cow. She's got the best glandular function. She's the only one here that's screaming, I love Texas. All the other cows were dusty and dingy and, and whatnot, okay? Here's those vertical folds that I was talking about we're looking for on the heifer, on the cow. Can, can everybody see the accordion look across here? A lot of butter fat. What would I like to see? Two extra teats, but I'm not gonna get rid of that cow. That's, that's a nice cow. They almost are always good cows. And if you know how to milk a cow, I, probably everybody on the call already has, but you know more about a cow uh, than uh, EPDs could ever tell you. So here we are back to cannon bones. I mean, this was a 1400 pound cow and oh my gosh, the meat was fantastic when we finally killed her at 13, 14 years of age. She had almost twice the intermuscular fat of any other animal back when I used to ultrasound. Gerald Fry taught how to visually identify tender, flavorful beef on the hoof. Whenever I say, butter fat think tender meat in this anyway not a big knee and then it gets very small right here and then kind of a bell bottom it just widens out just to the width of the ankle we don't want a big cross section we don't want it going like this we want that shape right there so i don't know jared in your reading of the bible did you ever figure out what uh, selection criteria <laughs> used to <laughs> select that particular animal. <clears throat> anyway, the one on the right is a um, 
half short horn steer. And he was weighing probably 1300 pounds. And I, I was there doing something else, but I told the owner, I said, whatever you do, do not cut any steaks out of that animal. He, he will be really, really tough. Uh, just grind the whole thing. And, and, but otherwise you'll have some upset uh, customers. If you notice the knee, I, I put it, the dots in here, let's just see how much bigger the knee is versus over here. Um, so that's your number one indicator of tenderness. Number one for butter fat is a bald udder. Number one for, for uh, <clears throat> tender meat is the, the fine cannon bone. Number two for both butter fat and tender meat are those vertical folds in the hide. Okay, so here we've got a cow and she's, she's not too bad, but we've got a, the cow on the left side of the screen and the, uh, the cow, the calf on the left and the calf on the right. This one I'm not gonna keep as a cow or I didn't, but this one had fine enough cannon bones that I did keep. So back to the question, can you see this in young animals? Absolutely, you can see this in young animals. Um, so unusually small legs for the size of the animals, what I'd like to say, looking at these two, I want the one on the left and not the one on the right. You see how much bigger this is? She's the one that's going to come up open. She's going to be the one that doesn't produce the calf that's in the top 10, 15, 20% because she doesn't have enough butter fat to do it. And again, any one cow can make a liar out of you, but in general, the more butter fat we're selecting for, the, the more fertile our cows. So while we're right here, and this is a pretty good picture, and then you guys can go home and decide, I don't know one thing about what I'm talking about. But if this cow here were eight months pregnant, maybe before, if she were eight months pregnant, and you see this hair standing on the pole, the hay is ready to swath, probably gonna be a heifer calf. Remember back to the adrenal hair world, when she's producing estrogen, the hairs stood up in the adrenal hair world, well, they'll stand up on her pole. If we've already swathed the hay, probably gonna be a bull calf. I told that to a guy in Texas, he was a month away from calving, he said he got 23 out of 24 in a row simply by looking at the hair on the pole. So you can go home and decide to delete everything I said if that doesn't work for you. Um, so just a Jersey cow and you can see your toes are pointed out just a, a little bit to the side, but um, some other issues, but you know, not bad. Um, here's kind of the gamut of what we find, but typically we're in this range. And if you've got this in your herd, you can't go to this with your bulls. You, you just have to go here, go here, go here to try to clean up the hoof problems in your herd. And part of the hoof problems could be an imbalance. No, I'm gonna be more firm. A part of the hoof problems in your herd probably is um, an imbalance of minerals and way too many toxins, okay? And sometimes it's too much protein. We feed, we feed protein because they can make money selling us protein. Um, but that's a different one. So I, I like the picture of this particular front leg because it's nice and straight. But then I was looking at it and I want it much smaller here underneath the knee. You know, maybe it just to be this wide and, and ever so slowly widen out to the width of her hoof, or I mean, to, of her ankle. Well, then I looked at it a little more. There are no bumps in that hoof wall. That, that cow had very good mineralization all year long. All right. Um, pointed pole, which we talked about, adrenal hair whorl, uh, right there. You can see the hair going 360 degrees. Uh, I already did that. So a lot of vertical folds in this bull. He is going to create daughters that have a lot of butter fat. If you, let's see, a good cow, a good cow can recreate herself in her daughters it, with a decent bull. It takes a really good bull for her to create better daughters and especially better sons. 
So we're, we're losing our bovines faster on the male side than we are on the female side. Um, more vertical folds in the hide. And I, as I said earlier, that's number two. Here's just a Brahmin bull. I'm, I'm not pulling all that hard. You can see how loose the hide was there. Um, so this is a quote out of that book by Francois Guinon. And uh, anyone can tell with certainty. There need be no doubt. This is not EPDs. He is the French government in 1848. That's what the French government said. If you would follow this treatise, and you can go online and either buy that book or, or get a PDF of it and, and read it. Anyway, the one thing that was in that book that um, Gerald fig was not was not in that book that Gerald figured out was over here to the shovel. And I didn't used to have a shovel in the slide. And I would talk about the spade and I'd always have somebody say, well, what's a spade? And, you know, I'm sitting there going, have you never had a shovel in your life, in your hands in your life? So having to not go through that mental anguish, I put this shovel up there. And if the angle is going up, that is more butterfat. If the angle is going down, that is less butterfat. So tall handle, wide handle, and then we want that up angle there at the spade. So here's a little bit of an up angle. This hair right here is all going uphill on the spade. And the handle goes from here. I, I can't see where it ends, but goes up hopefully clear to the vulva. Uh, a bald udder, number one. Um, the more butter fat, the less we have this problem. If we calve in sync with nature, we want to wean in sync with nature. And somebody's like, well, my cows would get chapped teats if I left those calves on in the winter. And, and I said, so when do you calve? Oh, January, February. I'm like, uh, <laughs> so if it was last year's calf, this year. Okay, that's a whole nother story about when to calve. We've got them in the chute. We look at the very bottom of the tailbone. The more dandruff and the more yellow, the more butterfat. We're looking in the ear the more yellow, and if, especially if it bleeds out onto the hair, the more butterfat. The more butterfat, it, it, it's free. It's more than free. She maintains herself and she has a good calf. So I was at a place in South Dakota and they wanted to measure the cattle and, and virtually every animal that we measured had the anti-fertility bone sticking up. And when you do that, and I'm going to do the pelvis thing again here. When you when you do this and the, the tail process jumps up, the, the vulva tends to slope forward. Well, that causes two or three problems, but the one you can see here is the bulls were in and things are dirty and he's going to take some foreign material in there and she's not going to rebreed. I mentioned this and he goes, Oh, these were all AI'd. And I said, well, that might have been the only way she was going to get bred. Uh, maybe you've bought a really good bull and he breaks his tool. Well, if he found a heifer like this, he missed the target. And that's what happened. So a vertical vulva. So we can see a breeding problem with this. We can't particularly see it on this cow other than she's telling us with this part here in the forehead that somewhere in there somewhere and it might have just been an epigenetic thing and if you figure fix your epigenetics in utero a clean mineral rich inner uterine environment that might go away uh, it might have been a toxin just at the wrong time well it's something telling you there's a problem anyway uh this cow's pretty flat you can see the hooks are down at least three flat from hooks to pins, the anti-fertility bones sticking up in the air. Hoping that sinks in a little more than the grow bone sticking up in the air. So this is right out of uh, Bonsma Lectures. And again, you can find that online. The milk beast on the left and the beef beast here on the right. Well, I would, what I would really like is that last rib pointing somewhere between the hawk and the ankle, but 
this girl is too flat on the bottom because her ribs are all rotated down vertical. If they're if they rotate back, the chest comes up off the ground a little ways. We've got the bottom of that solo cup cow. Look, here's the back end. Here, here's the head. Here where my finger is. Well, wait a minute. She's walking uphill. She's less fertile. I want to take some of that height out of the shoulders. Um, more on that in a little bit. Here's a cow, and and she's she's definitely got a lot of slope to that last rib. If you're out there, and and most of your cows, you can see the angle of the last rib, but you got three or four that they're so fat you can't see. In my mind, they're suspect. Next time you get them to a shoot, get two thirty seven in and and feel the angle of that last rib. It might be more vertical like this. The, this kind of cow tends to give you the dink calf. A friend of mine in Northwest South Dakota, we were just talking two or three days ago, and he had a cow that she, since she was a heifer, she was look, looking at her, she was his favorite. As a heifer, first calf heifer, she's nine or eight or nine years old now. He said, but I've never kept a heifer out of her until this year. And I asked him, he's in Northwest South Dakota, I asked him, I said, well, what's the feed been like for that cow the last two years? And he said, oh, we haven't had much feed. I said, she finally lost enough weight that she could nourish her calf. She had too much fat and wasn't doing a good job. For him, it's 25, 30 acres. He needs to send her, I had a cow kind of like that, and uh, her fifth calf. I could not keep her from getting too fat. Her brisket, you know, the dewlap was gone. And uh, her fifth calf, she, she was in the second 21 days finally and was kind of a dink. I took her to Western Wyoming where it was 125 acres for one cow to make a living as opposed to TJ where it's 250 acres <laughs> for one cow to make a living. Um, anyway, she had two bad calves and then, you know, the, the one that was born at my place, the next one getting adapted there. But then after that, she was back to having good calves. She was too deep. This bottom line was too close to the ground for my two acres to the cow, but it was just right for 125 acres to the cow. Different horses for different courses. How much time do I have here? I don't know. What am I, Jared? Yeah, I know we got started a little bit late. My next speaker will be on in 20 minutes, and he okay. only has a half-hour time slot. So, um, But that okay. being said, Steve will be available um, after hours on tomorrow, right? You, you're you okay yes. to on for a few so, minutes and, and answer specific questions. We can – we will just keep this Zoom yep. – Live. So, okay, we don't cover it all. This is a lifetime worth of knowledge. So, if you want to be here for the next year, we could do that. But this is just a good old. Yeah, and you can you can go on my website, uh, Taylor with an I, TaylorMadeCattle.com, and there's videos, and I go through all of this and other things. Uh, yeah. So I want to go back here. You see the vertical. You want vertical ribs on the bull to put the angle back on the cow. So this bull, I couldn't get a picture. He kept going around, but this rib is very vertical. It's, it's just aimed right at his prepuce. The last rib was aimed right at his prepuce. He's gonna give you, he's gonna give you those cows that do a better job of raising their calves. The, uh, the cows that are too vertical, they don't do as good a job. Anyway, we want a bull that looks like uh, eight pounds of sugar in a five pound sack, <laughs> Johans Eastman, but not by feeding grass. If you can see the epididymis here, walnut shape from 10 feet away, Gerald Wyatt, Classic Livestock Management Services out of Australia. If you can see that epididymis from um, 10 feet away, you have pretty good assurance the cow or the bull can service uh, 50 to 60 cows in the first 21 days. Um, I'm going to go by that. I'm going to go by that. Um, so linear measurement, just 
we've got this wedge shaped look as we go through all that. We, here, I want you to see this. This is a cadmium hump in the back, classic cadmium hump. You might get rid of it feeding, oops, feeding conditioner, ribbon conditioner and calcium. But what that is telling you is you've got cadmium going in, your mineral, fertilizer you used or fertilizer somebody used from the hay that you brought to your place. That's a big deal, okay? Uh, big belly, wide butt, slope from hooks to pins. Yes, question. <clears throat> um, I know um, Lassiter said you can't have a cow too long. I think you would disagree with that. Can you have a cow too deep? Asked TJ. Um, I used to think that it was two thirds, one third, two thirds body, one third leg, but that, uh, um, what do you think? Too deep? Is that possible? Oh, absolutely. 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 And, uh, if the box car would work, I mean, back to that cow that at my place at two acres, she, uh, she, uh, was just getting too fat. I took her war was 125 acres, TJ takes more. Uh, the big deal, TJ, is the angle of that last rib. You can have some cows that are deep in the chest. And if they've got all the butter fat, fine bones, and that last rib angle is back, she probably can work for you, but you can get them too deep in the brisk. I say the brisket, but I mean right behind the front leg, right right here, you can get them too deep. This particular cow right here, uh, you know, she'd probably be good for um, two acres to run a cow. You see where I put the bottom line? I mean, about where TJ is, that line might need to be two inches further down to be able to eat enough for three in that environment. Yes, you can get them too deep. I've actually seen a lot of that surprisingly, okay? So I'm trying to get, okay. So I mean, I want to skip by a bunch of stuff here, but Ken Redman, uh, he, in his thesis, took 9,500 head, all one breed, anywhere from Mexico to Canada. Three commonalities with old cows, cows that had had 10 or 11 calves in a row without skipping in different environments, all one breed again, three commonalities, a bigger belly than the herd average. They could eat and digest enough for three in a dry year after they lost their teeth. A wider butt than the herd average. So I'm gonna turn this upside down, but you can see how, how wide this pelvis is and. I had to do this, but can you, can you, ah, you can see there's a little bit of room here where I could pass this through. Well, I've got one that's not so wide. And it's got, if you can see them, bone spurs sticking out into the opening. I, can, I mean, I can't get this through there. The other one is an inch wider at least. The pelvic opening. Well, a big wide muzzle. We can we can get that that calf uh, out of that big wide pelvis, and and so it's calving ease and fleshing ability, and then slope from hooks to pins, which is calving ease. We're looking at cows from the back, and the pitch back there is like this. From the anti fertility bone down, we're pu pulling more calves if we're looking at them and they're wider like this the tabletop in the back, um, you're gonna be pulling fewer calves and they're easier keeping. Some cows are digesting 70% of what they're ingesting. This girl, some cows are digesting 40. There was a fellow in Ohio, who put a hodgepodge of cattle together. Hey, here's your best ones. These will work till you can replace them, but these three Herefords, I'm not against Herefords, but they, they, were, they were this cow. I said, you're just never going to make any money. And, and the next morning, you know, I get off of the plane flight uh, first stop and here's a voicemail. And he said, I'm thinking about those Herefords, all the other cows, they eat for two or three hours, get a drink, eat for a little bit. They go lay down, they chew their cud. Those Herefords, the reverse wedge, the no guts, they stand there at the round bale feeder and they eat all day long. 
they're the ones that are digesting 40%. They're the ones when their group is averaging 3% of body weight, they're consuming 4% of their body weight. So big belly, wide butt, slope from hooks to pins. I'm gonna go buy some of this stuff. So if you were linear measuring and you only wanted to do two numbers, it would be how much wider the rump is than the, than the length from hooks to pins, okay? 30% is maintenance cost. Well, the bigger the flank is to the top line from the pins to the pole, the bigger the flank is on the cow, the lower the maintenance. On the bull, we're the opposite. This is the bull you want. He's big up front. This is the cow you want. And then, and then what makes industry money is growth and carcass traits. Now, if you're direct marketing, that's an, there's more to that story, but there's no time today. I'm gonna go buy these. I'm gonna go buy all that, sorry. <laughs> I wanna get to some questions here. Big flank, there's, we lost the teeth. Um, okay, if this is the last slide I have time to do, I wanna do this slide. And I sent it to uh, Jared and he can email it out to everybody. But what I want you to really see here is sex hormones shut off all bone growth. See the hook bones, this is out of, Bonsma, this is right out of Bonsma, South Africa. I don't know more story. Look at the cross section of the tail here versus look at the cross section of the tail here. They're both on the top. They're both even with the with the the hooks. The only place for this thicker tail to go is down into the pelvic opening. Okay, so we've got slope from hooks to pins different on both of those. We got that. He drew, Bonsma drew the dotted line in here on this skinny tail, broom handle tail. I would be arguing today with Dr. Bonsma that this dotted line ought to actually be up here because that thicker tail took up more of the pelvic opening. Um, so there's a difference between those two. Drayson, teats, you don't want them on the neck of the scrotum or you'll have tilted udders. Um, the shape of the teat affects, uh, it's going to tell you what the daughters are going to have. This is all more stuff. Bald udder, you won't get the one on the left if you've got bulls that have teats down on the neck like the one on the right. Um, so we can get them too fat. And this is a little bit back to TJ's deal um and tell me jared when i got five minutes because i want to make sure we answer questions but if they're too vertical in the rib you can get them too fat to rebreed you're gonna have to take them to a place that requires a whole bunch more no i can't say that if they put fat cells in here as a calf you you you're you're shot there was a dairy thing in uh, Wisconsin. They took dairy calves off the bottle and they either went to a total mixed ration or all forage. They all calved it too. They all went on a TMR and those heifers, those dairy heifers that had never gotten any grain gave 2000 more pounds of milk per lactation than those that had gotten grain. If she's got two vertical ribs, she's putting too much fat in her udder. She's gonna be just like those dairy heifers no grain but but she's too efficient if that can be possible in your mind that a cow can be too she's taking care of herself and not her calf because that last rib is not angled back let's let's go to questions i well wait a minute there's a list of uh, there you go you want to take a picture but let's go to questions because i could talk <laughs> yeah, you got, a while you got exactly yeah. 10 minutes um yeah, let do you guys just uh, got a drink here? Kind of can be a little bit, a lot, lot of information in a short period of time, but again, this is being recorded. So, um, <clears throat> first question: Why is it? Why is this informative information different than what universities teach? My goal is to keep your money in your back pocket. The people who give money to the university. This is being recorded. 
Cargill, Monsanto, Pfizer, ADM, they fund the university and they want your money. So they're going to give you information that's going to get more of your money. I want your money to stay in your back pocket. God invented cows to eat grass. He didn't invent them to eat what Cargill, ADM, Monsanto, and Pfizer produce. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. That is my answer. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Great answer. Anybody else have a question? In the minutes we have left. Um, <clears throat> what um, I think everybody in the industry, you know, we're, we pride ourselves on what color our tractor is, on what breed we have. Um, what breed is best? <laughs> And that well, was a yeah. facetious question, Steve, I know. No, 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 no. You, you, we do have markets, and some markets say black is beautiful. I mean, Gerald, we're driving one day, and he said, I've been all around the world with this ultrasound. He said, I can tell you two things on average. On average, there's more meat in black Angus cattle than there is in red Angus. On average, there's better meat quality in red angus than there is in black angus so if you're selling meat you're better off to have red now you can find a black that's better meat quality than the reds and you can find a red that has more volume than blacks but it what is your market you can't get too far away from your market if you're selling into the feedlot a frame five cow still kind of keeps you in the game if you're direct marketing you probably ought to have a frame four cow to be more profitable selling into the grass-fed market. Uh, I did that for 20 years and oh, I wasn't a good marketer, so I can't wait to hear what Kim says. I told people <laughs> what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear. <clears throat> Very good. Did uh, I actually answer the question there? Or yeah, so that was actually my question. Oh. Um, and and I appreciate you answering that. That um, Yeah, there's good cattle in every breed, bottom line, right? And, the, and yeah. I remember what Gerald said is you can take any herd anywhere and pick 10% of that herd will be really good. Do you agree? Do you, do you know what Gerald was saying by the end? I mean, that is what he started out saying, but by the end, it was two to 5%. In the 15 or 20 years he was on the road, it had dwindled down to it was only two to 5% of any herd. Now, some yeah. herds, Mother Nature bats last. I was in uh, Wyoming, about 30 miles from where Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid used to hold up. 35% of their herd was fantastic because the terrain was so tough. Only the ones that would breed were in the herd. This, this slide, I guess I'm, I got to this because TJ's question, can you get him too deep? I wanted him to just see the difference in the bottom line of the cow. It still has to have the slope. Um, anyway, and then one, one other question, is it important to have slope from hooks to pin or is it more important to have slope from hooks to pins and a tail head that doesn't stick up or to have a big belly from Caleb? Oh, um, if I had to choose between those two, <clears throat> I guess I would choose the big belly first. Um, I lowered my cost. I mean, we're, we're, we're taking this cow and we're lowering the hooks down and we're going to have the anti-fertility bone sticking up, but she's got that big a belly and she's got butter fat. And he said, yeah, I would, I would take the big belly over the rump, but if you find a bull, you don't want a bull that has a big belly. He might be lazy. You want a bull whose mom, his grandma, his aunts, his sisters all have big bellies. Then you know you're breeding big bellies. You're breeding low maintenance into his daughters. So if you can find a bull that doesn't have this, I don't know. That's kind of a mushy answer. And I guess I would have to say it depends. And it's, you know, what is the biggest problem? And Michael Davis, God rest his soul. 
<clears throat> one day we were talking and he said, if I had you come and look at my cow herd, what bull would you get me? And I started trying to ask questions two different ways. No, nope, can't tell you that. All you can do is look at the cows. And I go, well, I would go in the herd, figure out what your biggest problem was. And I would find a bull that would fix that. And he goes, bingo, that was the answer I was looking for. So what is the biggest problem in your herd? That's the first place to start. The marginal efficiency of capital. If I spend a dollar, do I get $10 back, 375 or 95 cents? Well done. Um, okay, two more questions so far. Um, Sir. Can you review the star hair part on the forehead versus the slash? What is that? So the, the star is the, the testes and the ovaries are developed at the same time the pineal hair whorl, whorl as in star, hair going 360 degrees. If there is an imperfection in the pineal hair whorl, it turns into this scar testes and ovaries weren't developed quite right at that same time. Okay. And then probably better go with the last question here, um, which is a good one and something that I've seen also, hardly none of the fall calves born in September shed hair and why. Um, I see that with other fall calving cows, um, they just, those calves come out, they just kind of look ratty. They never really pop and bloom in the spring. Uh, well, I have seen where they have fescue that a lot of people have to um, calve in the fall, but it's not the way nature has it planned. Uh, there was just an article, I don't remember where it came from, but basically uh, there's way less colostrum made for fall calves to get than there is colostrum in the spring. We're kind of back to Fred Provenza and nourishment, clean, mineral rich in our uterine environment. So <clears throat> fall calvers and uh, Jared, give me a date that fall calving starts on. I just, I want, I need that so that I can explain what I have in mind. Yeah, so he says uh, calves born in September. This is Clark. Okay. Awesome. okay, so what have we just gone through? We've just gone through the summer and I don't know where he's at, but I guess I live out West. So I think about West. We've got all this dried lignified grass that is much oh, harder to get to. Okay, Cam's there you go. Thank so you. we've got this dry lignified grass that it's much harder for the cow to get the minerals out of three weeks before any mammal gives birth, there's a mineral transfer from mom to junior. If she doesn't have to give that calf, they get, and then doesn't have the colostrum of the quality and the amount, you know, that calf just never gets a good start and they suffer for their whole life. Now, if you had some, you know, different courses, different horses, but in Kansas, yeah, uh, all across the, would just take a line from Houston up to, to Bismarck, everybody, what is that, the Ishouette line or something? Everybody west of there has suffered greatly the last two years on everything, and, and drought has a long tail. We're going to see the lack of nutrition for a while. Sorry, bear of bad tidings. <laughs> Uh, that's great you guys so i put steve campbell's website address taylormadecattle.com um, in the chat that's a good way to get a hold of him we will have more information again he's going to be on after hours tomorrow his giveaway he's going to do um at the end of the meeting tomorrow and so again stay present and uh let's see okay selena's texted me i better ask this one last question steve um justin asks does a big belly mean they'll be more efficient a more efficient forage converter if the answer is yes then is it because there's a larger room and a more capacity for room and microbes to work breaking down the forage 
Yes. Short uh, answer. Uh, uh, short answer. Yes. Um, you can help that yeah. along uh, by what's going on in utero, and that's a longer story. But weaning in sync with nature, we put more villi on the inside of that larger room, and, and then we get even more digestion. Um, a, a pregnant cow will wean her calf four to six weeks before she has the next calf. So if we're weaning at 10 months, we're weaning in sync with nature. Well said. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Steve. Our next presenter just arrived. So we're gonna we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. <clears throat> I will go ahead and make him uh, co-host here. And then you can stop share on yours. Again, thank you very much. I think, man, the last hour and a half was pretty awesome. So uh, it says new share, but what do I do here? Just click it? Yes. Okay, I now I know. Um, no, we're, we're back to my, I don't know how to stop it. Oh, stop share. I see it finally. <laughs> Sorry. You're good. You're good. All right. Um, big round of applause, virtual round of applause for Steve Campbell. Tell you what, what an amazing man, what somebody who has um, paid the price to become truly an expert in his field. Uh, our next speaker here, we are going to shift gears, but we're going to go back to more of thinking, big picture thinking, thinking about leadership. And specifically, I've had people ask, like, I get the whole idea about creating a vision, but I really don't know how. I don't know where to start. Um, <clears throat> and so I've asked Tyler Watson to come on. He's been a mentor to me and to our family and some of my kids uh, for probably five or six, seven years. Um, Tyler, he is a personal coach. He's a business coach. Um, he's worked with us. He's helped to scale our business and increase our reach. And so I know some of you in your comments yesterday, you mentioned like you feel that call to share a message. And so I'd especially encourage you to tune in here, take notes of what Tyler has to say, um, because he is an expert at helping you dial in what your message is and how to be able to get it out to others. I've asked him to speak today specifically on creating a compelling vision for ourselves and for our businesses, and then enrolling others into that vision and ingraining it into ourselves. And so, um, yeah, like with everybody, there's not enough time to fully cover the subject. So we're going to get a taste, but it's going to be good. So Tyler, are you there? You want to go ahead and unmute? Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Jared, how's it going? Awesome. Thank you so much for joining. You're this is we got an awesome group of people here, largely livestock producers and uh, from international group, mostly in the United States. We've got people from Colombia, Chile. And so, yeah, you get a, you get to have a pretty far and wide reach here. It's very cool. Well, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm going to introduce myself real quick. I know I look like I'm 16 years old. Um, my name is Tyler Watson and my, my passion is helping elite performers be able to win in every area of life. So what does that, what does that mean? Well, it means that oftentimes when we are passionate about something, we'll go all in and we'll be like, I'm going to go grow this business or I'm going to go do this thing. I work with a lot of athletes and world-class athletes. And we all, we change our focus only to sacrifice things that are sacred to us, family, health, sometimes finances in growing a vision. But as I uh, grew up through, through my life, I saw this pattern happen with my own parents, which then led me to make changes in my own self. I watched my mom go through five divorces, my dad through two. I, I suffered with a lot of depression, suicidal tendencies, um, not feeling good enough. And I wanted to not have to sacrifice things that were important to me to have money and time freedom and health. How many in here, based on what you've went through, even just this is a new year. How many in here have a vision or something that you want to attain, but it feels like it's taking longer than it should? Just drop in the chat. Let me know if that's you. If you've got something that you you desire in your life, and maybe it just feels like a hope or a wish, but you would love to look back on your life and say, 
I did this. I totally created this. I was someone who owned it and was able to make this happen. So we got several people. Yes. Okay, cool. Well, for me, I wanted to have a lot of wealth and I wanted to have a great relationship with my spouse and I wanted to have a good family and I wanted to be spiritually in tune and I wanted, I wanted it all. <laughs> I wanted to have good health. And yet I saw all these patterns growing up that led me to struggle a lot. And as I started to work through these resistances with some of the techniques, I don't have a ton of time today, but as we worked through these, I was able to go from a place of making less than $13,000 a year. And I grew up, my dad, we had a farm. We grew up on a mountain. My nearest neighbor was two miles from our house. I had, we had 60 acres, a pond, two caves. So I lived out in the middle of nowhere in Pynchon Mountain in Arkansas in the Ozarks. And I hated people. <laughs> I, was like, I was the kid that would sit on the bus, look out the window and not want to talk to a single soul. I wish I could just live out off the grid. That's kind of my dad. And uh, we prepared for the zombie apocalypse. If you go to his house, it's like decked out for whatever happens, happens. And and that's where I came from, that that style of, of thinking and hard work, right? Which is Which can be good. However, some of those beliefs led me to think that I had to work very hard to make money, that I could only make ends barely meet, that I had to struggle, that it had to be something that was some, for someone else and not me. And as I started to work harder on myself than on my business and create my ideal lifestyle, I was able to go from a place of a poverty mentality to being able to make multiple six figures, be able to make millions of dollars, go out, travel the world, be able to have my three amazing kids and be able to have a good lifestyle and one that I don't have to sacrifice the things that are sacred to me. So I want to teach you some of the things that you can apply right now so that as you're creating your vision, you don't have to give up the things that are important to you to create what you want. Okay. And uh, we don't have time to go into a ton of the techniques because what I actually teach is that it's not just in the mind. A lot of us think, hey, let's do mindset. So I studied, I've invested almost half a million dollars in my personal development and went out through almost 500 different techniques and processes trying to work on all my junk. <laughs> and it's gotten me to where I am today, but I learned that there's some shortcuts. You don't have to put in thousands of hours of work on yourself and spend half a million dollars to make a change. In fact, change can happen in minutes. It does not have to take years. So I've taken people through processes to help them make their first 10,000 in a month, to help them make their first million, to help them be able to change their health issues, to be able to connect with their family in deeper levels. And we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of high achievers who are learning how to actually take ownership of their own world. And I hope to give you a, a bit of a, a taste of that today. So I'm going to teach you a couple principles. The first one is when you're thinking about creating your ideal business, right? Every, everybody Is everybody in here wanting to grow a business? Is that the, the main goal? Like you guys want to grow and expand in terms of business? Yeah? Okay. Sweet. So here's how to think about it. And you may have heard this stuff. I'm not going to teach you something new, but I want to reinforce it. And I want to help you not resist it so that you can embrace it. So I'm going to invite you to, to put some of your old, old education to the side and open your mind to a new way of thinking and feeling and being. Because ultimately, the only thing that's going to keep you from growing your business is you. That's it. You can find the structures. You can find the people. You can find the marketing. All those external things are out there and they work. But if you don't work, then you will sabotage things, you'll procrastinate, you'll get depressed, you'll have random things break down that cost money. And all of a sudden, all these external things are keeping you from what you truly want. And I'm sure we've all experienced some form of that. So the first step into creating wealth that is sustainable is to map out your ideal lifestyle before your ideal business. And too often we we go at a business first. So we're like, hey, I want to grow my business. I want to make $10 million or $100 million or $1 million or $10,000, whatever it is. And we go and we focus on that thing. 
ah, I want to have this ranch. I want to have this thing. I want to have, I want to have all these things externally. So before you even look at that, you have to put yourself into a space of almost, you know, uh, so I have a, a five-year-old and a, uh, seven-year-old and a, one. Well, she's two this month. So those, my kids are very creative thinkers. You ever seen a kid, they pretend, they play, and they can be all out, right? They don't judge themselves. They're just having fun. They're just go luck, happy, go lucky, right? And you have to kind of get into that space yourself to allow yourself to create something new. Allow an element of fun to come into your life. It doesn't have to be serious all the time to grow a business and to make money. And a lot of people that I coach, when we get into the money and growing a business, all of a sudden there's just this heaviness in the air. And they're like, oh, I just got to make money. And it's like a burden. Oh, debts and stress. And they have all these emotions tied to money or lack thereof. So then when they think about going creating money, they're actually programming in their mind. Great. I want more heaviness. I want more burden. I want more struggle, which is why they sabotage and they keep from doing things. So we have to separate ourselves from that for a moment and allow ourselves to be creative. And just pretend for a moment and say, cool, if I had my ideal lifestyle, what would it be? And I did this the first time I read a, a book called The 4-Hour Work Week. And I read this book and it's about this guy. He literally like works less than four hours and makes a ton of money and he delegates everything. And this was when I was making maybe six figures. Uh, it was like I made maybe 150K in a year. And I was thinking, man, I would like to like, how do I have more and create more? without feeling like I have to work harder or that I don't deserve it or feeling like it's difficult. So I read this book and I went through a process that I invite you guys to do. And essentially I wrote down and I said, okay, I took a pen and paper and I thought, okay, very specifically, how do I want to live my life day by day, Monday, Sunday through Saturday? And I thought, okay, well, if I woke up on Sunday, here's what I would do. Monday, here's what I would do. Tuesday, here's what I would do. The whole day, map it out of, okay, Monday would be a day where I want to vision and create something that is, excites me, allows me to get into my creative abilities. Tuesday, I want to work really hard, coach people and help them break through. Wednesday, I also want to work really hard and, and coach people and help them break through. And I, I want to do that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Friday, I want complete date time with my wife. I just want to spend all day with her. That'd be incredible. Like, that'd be so awesome. Saturday, I just want to have time with the family, not have to worry about any work. And Sunday, I want to dedicate to God and to feel really connected spiritual in, in my spirituality. So I mapped out how many hours I wanted to work. And at the time, I didn't believe that was possible because I was working Monday to Saturday, all day, all the time to try to make what I was creating. So I thought, okay, I have to step into that creative space. Don't base your future goals on your past perceptions. Don't base your future goals based on your past perceptions. So I had to create a new idea, not based on my past perceptions. So I thought this would be really cool. My doubts were there. I was like, there's no way this is going to be possible, but you just have to pretend. And as I started to create this, I thought, well, how would I really want this? Is this really what I want? And as you start to get more specific in your lifestyle, in how you want to live, how much service you want to give, how you want to spend time with your family, then all of a sudden you become 10 to 20 times more productive. You have to start to delegate. You have to start to create a new reality and build your ideal business around your ideal lifestyle. You see, if you do it the opposite and you create a business, usually you become a slave to the business. I work with people who make millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, and many of them are slaves to their business, no matter how much money they make, meaning that they're stuck in the business. The business owns them. They don't dictate their business. So the goal is, how can I create my ideal lifestyle, feel good enough, worthy, deserving, capable to create actually my ideal reality? And if you're anything like me, I grew up thinking that I had to work really hard, that I couldn't play before I finished all my chores, 
that I had all these rules that were in my past perceptions. So it felt morally wrong for me just to have free time. <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do with myself? What This is bad. So I tried all the MLM stuff. I tried a lot of money things, but nothing ever worked because my brain and my body had past perceptions that were pushing away my ideal scenarios and what I actually wanted. So there are techniques and processes to let go of those. Uh, we don't have time to go into that. Maybe, maybe I'll dive in a, a tad bit here. But I want you guys to just think about like, what would my ideal life be? And the key is, is make it as real as possible. Okay. Most, the more details, the better, even down to the very hour of how you spend each and every day of the week. We also thought, man, wouldn't it be awesome to go on a vacation every other month? Like to just spend a, and go on vacation every other, other month for a week and take a week off. And I thought, man, that seems so cool, but so like wrong. Like <laughs> It's almost like playing too much. Like, ah. And so I thought there is no way with what I'm doing, I can maintain a, a high six-figure income and do this. But I kept to the vision and I kept looking and I kept changing things. And after about seven, eight months, it, this happens fast when you focus on it. I was able to transition in a way where I had and was living that vision where I was making the same amount of money working only three days a week and being able to spend all that quality time doing the things that I wanted to. And I thought, wow, like I did it. That is so cool. And then we did the vacations and traveled all over and all sorts of things. And so as you go through that, you have the ability to create whatever you want in life. I believe we're all here with a purpose. I'm a God believer. I believe that we are here on this planet to create, to create what we want, not to be victims to the things that we don't want, not to be a slave to our business, not to be trapped in a world that we feel like we have no control over, but to be in control and at creation and cause over our own universe, our family, the things that we do. And if you don't believe that, you're going to struggle the rest of your life, no matter if you're given the best opportunity you're going to sabotage it. Studies have been done on those who win the lottery. Within about five years, almost 95% of them go back to their original income level. Why is that? It's called a threshold, almost like a thermostat. So if you, you've been trained a certain way to be comfortable with a certain amount of money. Back eight years ago, Tyler was comfortable with $1,000 a month. And that was like, what I accepted, and that was my comfortableness. As soon as I made over that, and I remember one month I made $3,000. I was I started to coach and I, I got this big sale. And then the next two months, I didn't sell anything. So it equaled out to about 1000 a month again. And I was like, what? No matter what, it's almost as if I just like sabotage and do stuff. Other times I would make money and then something would break. And I had to like, buy new things and new equipment and fix stuff, which brought my, even though you'd bring in more, what was kept was still the same. So that threshold is what you are used to. And the goal is, is to raise that threshold to say, how could I get to me? I wanted to feel just as comfortable with 10,000 as I was with 1,000. So then I got to where 10,000 seemed like 1,000. And I thought, what if I could get to where $100,000 seemed like $10,000? And I got comfortable with that. And now working on next level and next level to get comfortable with, could a million dollars feel just as comfortable as 100,000, which feels just as comfortable as 1,000, which feels just as comfortable as 100, so that you can dictate how much you want to create. And it's not dependent upon your past perceptions. Is this making sense to you guys? So how many in here? feel like you've had a threshold or something that's like, man, I just can't get past this barrier, this wall. And no matter what I'm doing, it just tends to go up and down with that. Anybody else relate to this? I've worked with thousands of entrepreneurs over the years, and I've never met one who hasn't had this. So the, the thing that you want to do is first recognize that it's a thing. Secondly, that you can change it. Okay. Um, 
with the nine minutes that I have left, <laughs> I my my one assignment for you, my my assignment that I'd love for you to do, even if we can't get to the changing of this, is to map out your ideal lifestyle. Even if you have to, and I, I encourage you to be in a space where you're not working when you do it. Go out on a weekend, go to the mountains, go somewhere where you can just create, tune out of everything, and just allow yourself to really sit with your ideal vision of like, who do I want to become? How do I want to show up each and every day? How do I want to spend my time? And then whichever story is greater will win. If your old story, your old paradigm of like, Tyler, I have to work hard. I'm struggling. Nothing works. Every time I touch turns to dust, <laughs> everything fails. Uh, I struggle. It's hard. That was my old story, my old paradigm. That was true to me. And it was a strong story. And I gave it a lot of energy and a lot of belief. So I had to create a new story, which was actually, I can make anything. I can create things. I'm a great leader. I can make changes. I can create a multi-million dollar company. I can spread it to the masses. I can keep a lot of the money. I can travel with my family. I can be godly and make a ton of money. I can have all these things that I want. I can have my health. I can have a six pack. I can be ripped. I can be fit. I can do this. Whatever it is. I have a lot of those things that I've been working on and gotten. Last year was my goal to get my six pack back. I got like a four pack. I'm almost there. So this year I'm like refining that. So we're always getting better. But whoever story, whatever story is bigger, the one you feed the most wins. So if you look at your current life right now, if it's not ideal, it's because you have fed that story more energy, more time, more focus than what you truly want. What you focus on grows. So if you are only getting what you're getting, it's because most of your presence is there. You have to create a new story. And you it's not just create it once and then set it and forget it. You have to focus on that. And I talk about aligning, getting every single organ, gland, and cell and memory and process of, of your brain to believe that story so that it is real. Because the only reason this feels real, this negative story, is because of all that evidence and those emotions tied to it, not being good enough, not deserving it, imposter syndrome, all that stuff. But if you can create a new story, a new reality, and embrace that, then you can truly achieve anything. And I, I know this kind of sounds like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever, but it, it, it really is. Like if you look at all of the people out there who have ever had any form of success, and even in your own lives, the areas of success, it's because you focused on it. You've put work into it. You put effort into it. And it becomes natural. It's just the way of doing things. And that's to be expected. So the goal is to let go of the old, create the new, and embrace that to make it a part of your identity. Yeah? Okay. So that's going to be your assignment. I do want to share a really random thing. I've got six minutes here. So in my world, I got tired of everybody telling me like just the theories and never giving me the tool or the process of how to change the threshold or how to change it to where I can embrace the story. That's why I went through and spent so much money on different techniques and processes. So I developed my own. It's called abundance alignment technique. It's a tapping, breathing process. It's weird, it's goofy, and it makes not a whole lot of sense, but it works. <laughs> so <laughs> I use it. I've used it to help change physiological responses, create stories within days. I've had people get out of anxiety within hours that they've had it for years. I've helped people get out of the poverty mentality that they've struggled with, be able to get on stages, be able to sell high ticket items, be able to create millions of dollars, because the only reason you're not doing it is why? Because the old story is stronger than the new. So if you can fully embrace that new story, get all parts of you to where your full identity is on board, you got it. It's your reality. It's your new norm. So is it okay if I share with you guys real quick this simple process? Are you guys down for that? Okay, we got a few, sweet. All right, so this process, you're gonna judge it. It's a tool, it's like a hammer. Now, to create an empire, you need tools. So the tool alone does not do the creating, you do. 
So learn how to use the tool. There's a lot of skills out there. Uh, I can even hook you guys up with my book if you'd like to learn some more of this. But the essence is when you think about your goal, or I can even give you guys uh, access. I just did a, a New Year's alignment uh, process last night where helping everybody embody your full vision and story as quickly as possible. So that was like a two hour training I did last night. If you guys like, I can get it to Jared and he can send it out to you guys so you can watch that and actually take your ideal story and then embrace it within a couple hours instead of taking years of doing it. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to tune into the resistance of your story, your new ideal, and you will feel it. Those of you who aren't feelers, it's there. You just got to train your body to feel again. We stuff things. We were taught not to feel, especially us who are in the farming realm. And uh, I know a lot of us are, are in that space where you just don't talk about emotions much. And I was taught not to do that. So uh, this is going to be a new language for some of you. So it's okay. Uh, you got to learn new things to create new results, right? So this is one of those new things. And what you're going to do is when you think of your ideal thing, you're going to tune into some resistance that you have around it. So let's say it's, I want to create a million dollars with my farm that I keep a third of the proceeds and I'm profitable, like whatever it is that's ideal for you, right? So when you think that, immediately your body is going to have negative responses, fight flight responses, which are actually allergies and addictions. The same type of allergy that your body has to a food is the same type of allergic response that goes on in the body when you think of a goal that you resist. It's the same physiological response. Same with an addiction. So the non-ideals that are happening in your life are actually addicted responses. When someone gets addicted to sugar or drugs or porn or whatever, depression is actually an addiction. So when you are addicted to something, the body keeps recreating it over and over and over. You can be addicted not just to substances, but to ideas, to certain incomes, every single thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to tune into those fight flight responses, those allergies and addictions, and what's called align them. The full version can take up to several hours. I'm going to show you the very quick version in two minutes. So here you go. <laughs> so you're going to vocalize the thing. You're going to tune into where you feel it and any resistance you feel, just tap that area. What you're doing is you're centralizing that response. So the moment that you vocalize something, it sends a signal to the brain, brain back to the body, the brain and body start to communicate it to the world. And like there were some studies done that only 7% of communication is verbal through words. 93% is through tone and facial expressions in the body. So we're actually picking up on those micro expressions and changing them at a physiological way so that you can reprogram your body within minutes. So uh, here's how you do it. So you're going to state your goal. You're going to tune into where you feel it. You're going to tap that area. Then you're going to do what's called a line, which you're going to tap on the forehead, go all the way down the back of the neck. So you're going to tap while breathing in through the nose, out to the mouth, into the nose, out to the mouth. You're going to do it three times in a row, into the nose, out to the mouth. Then you're going to pant like a dog while tapping. And I'll tell you why this works. I know it's goofy. Three times, and then you smile at the end. And what you're doing is the moment that your body kicks into a fight, fight response, the first thing to go is breath. So what you're doing is you're retraining your breathing, as well as the first thing after the breath goes, the, the body can and mind can only focus on one thing at a time. So when you're breathing and panting, you're actually putting your, your whole body into a state of hyperoxygenization. Hyper so then when the negative feeling comes up, it can only focus on one thing, which is I need to breathe. I need to actually like have oxygen and air. So it, it shuts off the fight response. And then at the end, when you smile, it releases an endorphin to show you that who, you're in control and you're actually recreating the responses in your body. So if you do this, uh, I can get you guys the training. I'll, I'll send that to you, Jared, so you guys can go through it. But if you do it thoroughly, you will be able to make changes literally that take 30, 40 years to happen in hours or days. And it's amazing. 
So uh, can you do this with children with anxiety? Yes, you can do this with, with anything. It's pretty crazy. When I say anything, like I have seen it help people who have had uh, glycomas in their eye, totally vanish. I've seen people do it with uh, food allergies, gluten, soy, lactose, anaphylactic shock. I've seen it with depression, anxiety, suicidal tendencies. I've seen it with porn addictions. I've seen it with uh, making money, resistance to actually selling, being fearful on stage, uh, water phobias, uh, car wrecks every year. People who got in a car wreck every year. It's just a pattern that they're used to. And it was an addiction, literally causing people to get in a car wreck. So like the, the things, once you start to dive into the power inside of you, you realize that you're not even, we don't tap into even a, a fraction of what we're capable of. So anyway, uh, that's my give. I have another meeting right now, but I wanted to, to share that, give you guys some inspiration and hope, create your ideal life story, build your business around it, and then start working on yourselves passionately every day to get through that so that you can embrace that identity and create what you want instead of taking years. If you think about the story, oh, think about like, Anybody read uh, Genesis when it talks about Moses leaving, right? And he sets the people free. Well, what happens is as he sets the people free and he crosses the waters, then how many days did it take them to get to the promised land? It was 40. a 40 year journey. Now, do you know the distance of walking from where they were to get to the promised land? 13 days was how far it was. So the question is, why does somebody wander going in circles for 40 freaking years trying to get to their goal? Well, it's because even though that they left bondage physically, their spirit and their mental capacity was still enslaved and in bondage. They did not learn the lessons. So they continued to wander and be stuck for 40 years. Too often in our life, we're stuck going in circles. And you think it's going to take 40 years, but your goal is could be 13 days away. So I'm going to encourage you as you start to embrace that and confront it, don't be a victim, embrace a new identity and stop taking 40 years to get what should only take 13 days. Yes. <laughs> cool. That's All awesome. right. Thanks guys. I got to go. Have an awesome Thank time, you. Jared. Awesome. Thank to see you, Tyler. You. We'll look for your information and share it. All right. We'll see you guys. Okay. All right. So thank you to Tyler, special guest speaker. And I wanted to bring him on. Um, you know, I hope, I know we're a bunch of agriculturalists. We don't talk about emotions. We don't talk about feelings. Some of this stuff seems woo woo. And like, what the heck is he talking about? This young kid, there's no credibility there. Um, <clears throat> but if you think fight or flight or freeze, those are natural responses. We've all seen it in livestock if we've worked with them. And stress in livestock causes, leads to disease, lack of performance. It's the same thing with us, right? If we are stressed, if there is something that's not in alignment, then we can't operate at 100% efficiency. And so that's basically what we're doing is we're aligning, we create this, we're creating something spiritually, which is our vision. We're aligning with it so that we can create it on the physical level. Um, again, thank you to Tyler. And so we'll share his information. Um, if it resonated with you, great. Reach out to him. He's got some free trainings and things. And, and uh, you know, we're just going to kind of, if we're going to be regenerative farmers and ranchers, we need to be effective. And we can't be effective if, they're, if we're dealing with things that are sabotaging our success. We can't be as effective, right? It's just like more effort, it takes more effort. So we're going to introduce our next speaker. Um, this, this man, Chris Miles, he has worked in the financial industry for um, probably his whole adult life, his whole career. But yet, be careful, don't call him a financial advisor. That's kind of a dirty word for him. Um, I'm going ahead and making you co-host here and you can unmute. Um, <clears throat> because financial advice is generally costs i mean it's costs you a lot so he's going to talk a little bit about that he's got about 45 minutes to share and specifically i've asked him to speak about how to create passive income ways that we can use maybe some of the untapped equity that we have in our businesses 
to be able to create passive income. Now, yesterday I said we shouldn't subsidize our businesses. Um, let's draw a distinction here. We're not subsidizing it. We are just utilizing an asset to be able to be good stewards over it. And I think that's ultimately the what Christ taught in the parable of the talents, right? Those who came and returned upon what they'd been given, um, well done. Those who didn't, it was taken from them. And uh, I think he'll help to dispel maybe some of the myths about investing and when we say investing, he's not saying go and blindly throw money at stocks, right? It could be your business could be the very best investment that you could make, right? And if you follow Alan's principles yesterday, you will know if your enterprises are working or not. So you'll know if you should put more money back into your business. But if you have extra equity specifically or cash flow from your working enterprises, Chris can help us find ways to be able to do that. So Chris Miles, he's... He's a father, he's a husband, he's helped um, thousands of people throughout the United States be able to become financially independent, and I really look forward to your message, Chris. Yeah, same here, Jared, appreciate it. And it was really cool seeing Tyler there just for just for a few minutes when I, I came in there. I've never actually seen Tyler present on anything before. We've always just been Facebook friends. So it was really kind of neat to see, just get that last little tidbit, that little snippet that he gave us there. That was really cool. So uh, now I just want to hear from you guys. Uh, where are you? Where are you? Or where are all y'all? Okay, like where are you? You know, where are you located? Go ahead and type in the chat. I just want to kind of see and, and get a feel for um, just you know where you are. If you're around where I am in Utah, are you Nevada? Are you all over the place? We got Texas. There's some ne Nevada right there with William. You got Black some Idaho. Idaho people here, Chris. Got oh some, yeah, got some people from Chile, Colombia. Earlier, Missouri. You got Wyoming, Indiana, Oklahoma, Columbia, Columbia. Oh my goodness. Wow. Iowa. I actually got an employee in Iowa. Ashland, Oregon. I'm actually from Oregon. Southeast Oregon. Oh my goodness. Southeast. There's nobody in Southeast Oregon. <laughs> Incredible. Awesome. California, Wisconsin, Canada. All right. Logan, Quebec. Well, good. You, got, you speak Quebecois then. All right. Well, good. Good to see you guys. You got Kansas as well. Um, really excited to be here for, I mean, really, because, I mean, Jared, I, I've known you now for probably going on about 15 years, isn't it? Uh, since we met back in the Garrett J. White days and things like that. So um, really excited to be able to talk to you guys, because really my message is, is about freedom, right? Hope, freedom, and Jared mentioned stewardship. You know, that parable of talents, I teach that one all the time, right? is what are we doing with it? And it doesn't mean you have to become a, a multi-billionaire or anything like that. That's not what this is about. Really what we're trying to do is get you your freedom back. Uh, I mean, I'm just curious, how many of you guys would love to have more time, especially not just more money freedom, but more time freedom as well? How many of you guys would love that? Yeah, exactly. So awesome. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna bring up a little PowerPoint here. Don't get scared just because of PowerPoint. I just know that many of you guys are visual, not, uh, audible only like I am. I'm more of an audio kind of guy. Uh, so I'm going to bring this up here, but like, a, let's see, how the heck do I use it? Sorry, I'm trying to do this with all your beautiful faces moving you around there. So, so I'm going to talk about some of the best passive investments in the year 2023. And I'll, I'll echo what Jared said too. I mean, the number one, number one investment you guys have is your business. I mean, that is the economic engine that you guys have, right? That's the place you should really be focusing and making profitable. But the question I always get from people is, yeah, but Chris, I can only reinvest in my business so much before it just doesn't become worth it, right? Like I can put more in, but then the output just doesn't give me as quite that bigger multiplier effect. My stewardship doesn't grow as much. What else can I do? Well, that's kind of what I want to talk about today is how can you actually create additional streams of income on the side as well? A little bit about me and my family, like we... We're actually in Utah. We snowbird for the wintertime. In fact, we are literally leaving tomorrow. I'm doing this without my wife knowing uh, because she would totally kill me right now. She knew I was working instead of packing. Uh, but we are leaving for Hawaii for a month. Uh, they're out of the house. So if I all of a sudden get, you know, this cuts off early, you'll know that my wife just killed me. Okay. So, um, but Jared invited me. I'm like, okay, I can't resist. Like you guys are amazing. Like you guys are like the heartbeat of America in, in so much of what we do here, especially in your, your field. So <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, anyways, um, blended family. We've got eight kids between the two of us. I've got six. She's got two. Therefore, she's more stressed out than I was <laughs> because uh, her she quadrupled her kids when I just went up, you know, 25 percent or 33 uh, percent financially independent twice by the time I was 39, which we'll talk about today. 
And in my business, I'm actually now kind of semi-retired, but I came back out of retirement a few years ago again for the second time to really teach people to do what everybody asked me, which is how did you do it, right? So I'm more standing in the CEO, kind of the owner's box of my company, and now I'm getting a lot of my other people in my company doing a lot of the work for me, which is great. So I'm more the teacher, which is what I love doing. Even when I was retired, I still love teaching. And that's why I even have my Money Ripples podcast. I've had, now we're going on to the ninth season of our podcast now on YouTube and iTunes and everything. So, uh, But mainly we're talking about people getting out of the rat race. We even do things with infinite banking. If you guys ever heard of that, we do that as well. Uh, a lot of times people will see my Facebook post and say, all right, how'd you do that? It's funny because the guy that actually said, show me uh, right here, Rob, uh, he's a friend of mine out in Pennsylvania. This guy is actually a real estate investor. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's you know it's bad when real estate investors say, wait, how do you create passive income? Uh, he's more of an active real estate investor versus a passive one. So when I talk about real estate investing, for example, we're talking about like passive where you're hands off. You're not spending a lot of time and attention becoming a landlord and things like that. There are much more passive ways to do it where you can have time freedom along with the financial freedom. Uh, my real inspiration, though, is uh, is my dad. You know, this is a picture of my dad, as you can see back there in 1994, so almost 30 years ago. Um, you know, with my dad and all, he, hardworking guy, great guy, taught me great values, hard work, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's the kind of guy who worked in the automotive industry, sold, you know, automotive parts and things like that. Um, I would always joke that he would make car mechanics blush because he would swear so much. I mean, you know, it's that bad, you know, when... My dad, you know, the car mechanics say, hey, buddy, you're slowing down your, your mouth there. And that, that was my dad, right? Um, just he was actually even comparing him to Fred Flintstone because he had that short fuse. It's always going off, always angry about stuff. But again, a good guy, you know, and taught me a lot of things. But the one thing, the one thing he would not teach me, um, at least not very well, was money. The only thing he taught me about money was don't spend it. Save all of it as you can, because really, kid, I can't afford to pay for any of your college. So best of luck to you. You know, you're on your own. So the day before I turned 18, I'm going to college, you know, and uh, trying to take care of myself, which was great. I loved it. But definitely when I remember as a kid thinking, I don't want to be like him because he'd always use the phrases. And maybe you've had parents like this, or maybe you've even said some of these phrases where he's saying things like, you know, we can't afford it. What do you think I am made of money? Money doesn't grow in trees, you know, or my very favorite was. You know, especially on those hard working days, he'd say, Chris, I'm going to work until I'm dead. Like my job will literally kill me. And it just about did. I mean, the guy had strokes and heart attacks in his 40s. Uh, it's amazing he's still alive, even at the age of now almost 79. Um, he's seriously only here because he's like the bionic man. They've replaced every part in his body and organs and everything else. And he's just half robot, half machine, half human now. So it's uh, pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. And so I vowed I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to have that kind of life. So I went to college, first one of my family to go to college. And while I was there, I was going to become a business consultant. That was my goal. But I thought if I'm going to do that, I shouldn't have real business experience. So I ended up taking a what was supposed to be a one-year sabbatical. You know, it's supposed to be, it's like the three-hour tour from Gilligan's Island, right? I was supposed to just drop out for a year, try my hand at business a little bit, get some experience, and then go back and get my master's and MBA and all that stuff. Well, I dropped out, said, what kind of business should I do? And the first one that came up was becoming a financial advisor because I thought, hey, I don't know anything about money. It'd be really good to learn more about it. And maybe, just maybe, I can give my dad some of his life back. And that was the real driving factor for me. So I ended up becoming a financial advisor, you know, totally commission only, started that, started doing that path. And after several years, then my dad actually asked me for financial advice. He actually asked me to sit down with him as dinner table, the very one that I also sat at. He was telling me to save everything and spend no money, right? And I sit down with him. He says, all right, Chris, I'm 61 years old. I'm ready to be done with this. Y2K hurt. I don't want to have to keep doing this anymore. So can I retire or how can I retire? I look at his numbers and I said, dad, I know you're a blunt guy. So I'm going to be blunt. Honestly, if it weren't for social security, you better hope you die in five years because that's how long your retirement will last. Even though you saved everything you were supposed to do, saved your 401k, loaded it up, you paid off all your debt early, you were so proud of that, yet despite you're being debt-free, you've been saving everything, you're like Dave Ramsey's older brother that he looks up to. Despite all of that, guess what? It's not enough. He said, all right, well, what do I do? And I said, I don't know, because as a financial advisor, you did everything that we've been teaching people to do. And that was a big wake-up call to me because I realized this, is that 
despite the fact that he did everything right, he was still in the rat race. Despite the fact that even, you know, he's, I mean, it, everybody, I mean, I looked at all my own clients, right? I, everybody that was doing the same path, they also were not financially free. Even retired doctors, people that made lots of money, they would still worry about running out of money. And then I looked at the financial advisors. One of my friends said, well, Chris, how many of these financial advisors are free, not off the commissions they're earning, but actually doing the investments you've been recommending? And as I thought about it, I said, I think none of them. <laughs> and I was right. Uh, even guys that have been working there since the late 1970s could not retire off of that stuff. And that's when I vowed. I said, okay, that's it. I can't teach this anymore. Either I keep teaching it because my paycheck relies upon it and I put blinders on or I leave. And I chose the latter. I left. I said, I'll never teach about money again. I'm done. I'll just be a mortgage broker. And then I'll teach ballroom dancing at a local university. A uh, little side note, I was one of the nation's top amateur ballroom dancers. So if you ever watched Dancing with the Stars, those were some of my friends back in the day. Um, so I was doing that. But I wanted to know how people did it because I knew there was people that were financially free, but they weren't financial advisors. They were sometimes in their 20s and 30s doing it. I had to know what they did. I, really, like, what did they do to do that? That's what I'm going to teach you guys here today is that very same thing because I, I was able to apply it myself. And after quitting being a financial advisor, quit. And then later that year, was able to be financially independent myself for the first time. Um, I say financially independent twice because the, the uh, last recession kicked my butt, the Great Recession. Had to come back out of that hole. I actually dug out of a million dollar debt hole, had to pay it all back and was able to become financially independent for the second time in 2016. So what I'm here to show you is that this stuff actually works, okay? Um, Warren Buffett, I love this quote. If you don't find a way to make money while you, or you, while you sleep, you're going to work until you die. All right. And that's why we need multiple streams of passive income. Even if you make great money, millions of dollars, just like my friend Rob, who said, show me, made millions of dollars as real estate, you know, active, like flipping and, and renovating type of business. Yet he wasn't financially free at that time either. Uh, by the way, just as an update, I saw him last month. He finally got to the point where he's now financially free. But, uh, but that's the thing. We want to make sure you have multiple streams of income just in case something, the worst were to happen, right? We always want to have that coming in. So let's talk about really what those passive investments are, like what we talk about with our clients and whatnot. So the first one you see on the left here is turnkey rentals. This is not your typical rental that you're buying in your backyard or your neighbor, you know, your neighboring city or wherever it might be. This is actually where you have a company, you can actually have them find the properties for you, right? So it's almost like a buffet. You know, you go into that, that buffet line where they say, here, take a pick. That's kind of what they do. They say, here's properties. Here's the returns expected on these properties even before you buy it. So you know how much money you're going to make up front. You go and pick the property. They set up the financing for you if you need to get financing. And then they property manage it for you as well. So you are completely hands-off, not a landlord. I realized that before the last recession that I was trying to be my own landlord and I was horrible at it. That was one of the reasons among many that I suffered in the recession was because I was not the kind of guy to collect rent, okay? I was, I was too much of a pushover. But- I have property managers now with properties in multiple states. So I've got properties in like North Carolina, Tennessee. I've got properties in, in uh, where else? Alabama, right? I've got you know, properties around there. I've got properties in different places, especially in the Southeast and Midwest that I do not touch. I don't do anything with them, yet they still make me easily double digit returns. You know, And that's just on the cash flow, right? I'm not even talking about the money I make from appreciation. That's just gravy. You know, I don't care about appreciation because I learned from the last recession, you, don't, you never want to bank on that. You know, you want to bank on what's actual income coming into your hands, net profit. That's what really always matters. Just like in your, your business, net profit is always the number one key. You know, if you don't have profit, you don't have life, right? You don't have freedom. And so that's the key right there. So turnkey rentals are a great way to do that. Um, another one is lending. You know, you can actually become the bank where you lend your money to people, they invest it, and then they pay your return. Caution here. Naturally, especially as we move into what I believe is the next recession here, and it could be in a lot of ways worse than some of them, better than others. But I'll tell you, um, when it comes to this kind of situation, you it's more important about who you're investing with than about what is being invested in. The who is, is always more important because I, I saw the last recession. There were so many people that had great investments, great deals. Everybody always talks about how it's always awesome. Yet, when push comes to shove, when it really comes down to the, you know, when somebody's under stress, their character, their integrity is what's in question. Will they keep paying you even when times are tough? That is why we've, we've spent over the last decade plus 
building our network of people we have as like preferred operators, preferred investors that we can feel safe putting our money with. Doesn't mean that's 100%. And in fact, there's risk in all of these things. And there's nothing that's risk free here. But um, the great thing is you're buying real into real assets. I'd rather buy into real assets than put my money in some crappy stock market that I have zero control over. And that, uh, you know, it can be influenced and actually messed with by AI. Did you know that the artificial intelligence controls 90% of the trades in the stock market. I can't compete with that. Even though I used to be a stock trader, I still can't compete with that kind of crap. So I, I like control. I like to have ownership, that kind of thing. And so that's where lending, you can become like the bank, lend the money to somebody else. They pay you a set return, a contractual return to saying, I will pay you X percent. Uh, many of the people in our in our our Rolodex of investors that we have generally pay between about 10 to 12 percent is pretty typical. Um, that's enough so that they can still have profits on their on their property. They can still walk away with a good amount of money, but they pay you an amount that's pretty fair as well. Uh, funds, funds are more like pooling money, right? And there's sometimes people might be lending, but you might instead of just lending to one person, like what you might do on a fund, like a lending or a note situation, you might have multiple amounts of loans out there. And so there's funds out there that might be investing in different loans. They could be funds that could be investing in their portfolio of, of rentals as well. And you just get paid the profits on that. So you're like an equity partner on those rentals. So there are lots of different types of funds out there beyond mutual funds. And I don't mean real estate investment trusts like REITs. People say, oh, is that why I should invest it? No, those are horrible. <laughs> those, those are not even real, real estate. In fact, last year in 2021, many of my my friends that were real estate investors all over the country were saying that people that were buying up their properties for sick amounts of money, just ridiculously high amounts of money, were those real estate funds. Because they just said, hey, I don't care if I lose money. I mean, if you guys remember like Open Door and things like that, you know, those companies, Zillow, they were buying up properties left and right, didn't care what the price was. They would offer about 20% higher than the going rate, than the appraised value. You don't want to invest in places like that where you know that those things can tank because they're just trying to throw their money in something. They were desperate to try to get the money out there because people kept throwing money at them. You don't want to be in those places. You want to be in places that are actually controlled environments. Now, you can also be in other types of investments like what are called syndications. Uh, syndications are essentially where you pull your money together, similar to a fund, but not the same. A fund might be just a set interest rate they'll pay you, where a syndication might say you will share in the profits. Now, they might just pay you a certain interest rate too, but you actually have an equity position in these kind of things. This could be invested in things like apartments, as you see right there, self-storage. Uh, by the way, I'm just starting to see a, a real good comeback in self-storage just in the last six months, where the same property that last summer, you would, you know, and, and everything like with apartments or self-storage, you buy it based on the profits. Well, they were making the multiples so high in the profits that that same property you bought in July or August for $1.5 million is now selling for $1.1 million as a self-storage type of facility. So now they're getting bigger profits with a lower price. Those are starting to come back. So there are actual types of syndications that are based on that. Um, we've also got like oil or mineral rights. Um, this is one I love, particularly it's been kind of one of our darlings in our, in our portfolio. Uh, I know Jared knows this too, because he's got some investments there as well. But the cool thing is you can not only get paid on a lease of the land from the oil companies, and these are like the mid-size. Don't sell the Exxon Mobiles because they don't, they're not care, they're not care about profit as much. But the more the mid-size ones are worth between one and five billion dollars, those companies just want to lease the land. They don't want to own it. They just want to drill the land and move on and just keep drilling and drilling and make money. This is domestically speaking, like Oklahoma and places like that. Well, we got investments where they're doing their drilling in Oklahoma. We get paid a lease on the land, whether they make money or not. And then we get to share in the royalties of the mineral rights that are pulled out of the earth, whether it's oil, natural gas, or whatever they pull out, you get paid on that too. So you kind of get this extra little double dip effect, getting paid on two different things. Uh, so that's been one of our darling investments that we've been doing as well, where you can actually have land, it's real estate based, but you're also getting the benefit, especially if oil prices keep going up. If you're going to pay more at the pump, you might as well make more money on it on the side too, right? <laughs> so... And then the last one I have here is partnerships. Now, partnerships is kind of an interesting one too. And, and I know Jared and I both have experience in this as well, um, where again, you're partnering with somebody and you go into investment. So it's really this uh, very much, you know, I wouldn't say handshake deal. There's contracts and everything, but it's very intimate in the sense that you're not with a lot of other investors. You're just working with some person. Similar to like doing short-term lending where you might go into a specific project, you would do the same thing. 
Um, I have a particular partnership right now where we actually have them doing all the land flipping. We, they buy and sell raw land. So they'll buy it for cheap, turn around and sell it often to their neighbors or to other people who want recreational land or whatever it might be, or builders and whatnot. And usually you make at least a 40 to 50% per year return on the money that I've had invested. So again, I'm hands off completely. They're the partner doing everything. They're a 30% partner. I'm 70% because I'm financing it all. Um, I love it. You know, I'm going to, like I said, net, I'm getting about a 49% rate of return on that kind of thing, which is awesome. It's been awesome. It's been amazing. And, and the thing is with raw land is not many people really are buying or doing that kind of stuff. Uh, you guys get it because you guys do with land all the time, but most people that are real estate investors are just trying to buy apartments or duplexes, fourplexes, single family homes. They're doing all, they're competing in that space. Very few are competing in raw land. So a lot of different options that are there that are just outside the Wall Street option. And this is more what they refer to as Main Street, right? This is more like the real assets, something that's tangible, something that's real. It's not some arbitrary number on a, some stock ticker that you see that you don't know whether you have the money there today or tomorrow or ever, right? That's the kind of investing we talk about. All these things create great passive income. So let's talk about like how some of our clients have been doing it, right? Like I mentioned some of the things that I've been doing where I buy turnkeys, I have syndications, I lend money, I, I have partnerships as well, like I mentioned, and mineral rights and all that kind of stuff. But here's some other people of how they've done it. Uh, one couple, I call them R&D, you know, I just kind of keep them anonymous. Uh, we actually, the cool thing is before we even got started, we started to look at their whole picture. We looked at their income and expenses and on the whole, you know, picture, their balance sheet and everything found out we could actually free up about $3,800 a month in loan payments. So I said, even before you guys start investing, and they had a lot of money in stocks, like ridiculous amounts in like Facebook and Google and things like that. I said, guys, you don't know if you'll make money there, but if we pay even just like a hundred grand, you could free up three, $3,800 a month. You know, and we did some things like mortgage refinancing and things like that. So even before we started to really invest, they had already been making now, improve their cash flow by over 40,000 a year. So right there, that was huge. Then we also found out their tax savings, actually that tax savings number is bigger. I think it's closer to 20 or 30,000, maybe more per year that they're actually saving on taxes because they're business owners. Uh, we, have, we have different CPAs and people on our team that look for ways to find and free up money that way too. Um, we had them sell a rental that was, just was horrible. It sucked. So we had them sell that and then reinvest it into a different type of property that actually was cash flowing now, uh, improve their cash flow by 2,000 a month. And then moving out of those dumb stocks that they had, um, they have 5 million. They haven't sold off all their stocks um, that could actually get them over a half million a year. They have sold off a couple million of it. So they've already got it into the six figures of, of how much they've been able to improve their cash flow by ultimately just about getting themselves to the point where they're financially independent easily. Um, even if they shut down their business today, they wouldn't need it. Um, so the cool thing is now they're what I refer to as work optional, right? You work because you want to not because you have to. That's when you really know, am I do, living my passions? Am I doing what I truly love? Am I really living my life's purpose? That's the kind of cool place you can get to. Uh, another another uh, couple here. Sorry, I just let somebody in the room. So uh, actually, this is a woman here. Uh, with her, she had about 650000 She did do some of it into oil investments, like the mineral rights investment I mentioned. She did put some of her money into a debt fund, you know, with uh, you know doing hard money lending and things like that. Another real estate fund that she had in total, that $650,000 generates now $76,000 a year, just over $6,000 a month for her. Um, that was just all in the first year here. Uh, another person here, they had about $270,000 savings, um, just put into a 10% kind of fixed fund there, making $27,000 a year, able to refinance their home and do a, a home equity line of credit instead to get that equity and invest it. That nets, even after the mortgage payment, about $17,000 a year. Um, and then we just had them pay off the lease. We said, hey, you have this small lease here that you're paying 300, 330 bucks a month, pay that sucker off. And so they did. And so that's about 48,000 a year for them on that situation. Uh, Jared mentioned this, like really using, one of the key things I'll mention this before is where do you have assets? Where do you have that potential? Net worth is worthless unless you're having passive income come from it. Let me repeat that. Net worth is worthless unless you have passive income coming from it. Unless it's paying you, who cares what your net worth is? I've never seen anybody on their tombstone. I mean, at least anybody I think is you know credible. Nobody's put on their tombstone saying, "Hey, I died with you know ten point seven million dollars net worth." You know, here lies Fred. Nobody cares, right? Nobody cares about your net worth. Is how do we live that life while we're alive? Not how much money and what looks on a nice little sheet of paper. I have another person here. Uh, we'll keep them anonymous as well. 
refinance his his uh his property he had a big property you know with he was trying to get a lot of money out of it. took him a good several years to do that um put some money in oil investments short-term real estate development even looked at doing some turnkeys and other outside investments with some of the remaining money um i think the number is actually bigger than that now i'll have to verify that with him but uh but yeah i think that number is actually right around uh, when all is said and done at least probably almost pretty close to twenty thousand a month average when you average it all out so uh uh, recently, I had a guy on my podcast, uh, this guy, uh, Dan Marker, he's actually been on my podcast twice in the last year, and he keeps asking to come back on. We had to tell him he has to take a break for a little bit so other people could be on. We had Jared on. That's part of the reason, right? Um, but yeah, Dan Marker, he was a colonel out in California. He's the fourth highest ranking colonel in the National Guard in California, uh, which he says doesn't mean anything. It just means he's the person they actually call at 3 a.m. where the other three generals above him you know, don't get uh, don't get any phone calls. Uh, but he just retired, had a million dollars in his plan. And he said, all right, my financial advisor just said that million dollars. If you have mutual funds, you, you know this, because if you go to a financial advisor, they'll say, a good one will say, you should only pull out maybe 3% a year, right? A, a better one would probably say 2% a year to make sure you don't run out of money, especially with inflation. But usually 3% a year is what they tell you to pull out. Well, Dan's saying, wait a minute, a million dollars I have in my pension plan. And he actually was able to avoid Y2K. He avoided the Great Recession. He actually pulled his money out of the market at the perfect times. He did everything, not just right, he did it better than right for, compared to most people. And yet, he's supposed to live on 30000 a year with that million bucks. Think about it. You're a millionaire living below the poverty line. You're essentially a broke millionaire. Uh, he didn't want that. And so he actually was able to get his money moved around and did many of the same stuff that we just showed in some of those examples. Uh, he's right now, uh, he's netting $11,000 a month from that million dollars that he used. So uh, this is the big thing, guys, that ultimately cash flow, passive income, having more, ca more cash coming in than what you need is what creates freedom. Because when you have more cash flow coming in, more passive income coming in, that creates options. And when you have more options, that's when you know you're truly financially free. And I get it because there's been times, a lot of times in my life, most of my life, I have not been financially free. And, uh, and I'll tell you that even if you make good money, good income, the thing always in the back of your mind is, what if that stops, right? It's the thing that's, that's in the middle of the night that, that you kind of suffer in silence. And maybe you try to push out of your mind to just put it away. But ultimately, you have to ask yourself, well, what happens if my income stops? What do I do? That's why cash flow is so important. So here's my tips for you guys. Get lean, get liquid, and get out. Uh, I've been saying this since 2020, uh, especially as things started getting crazy. Um, I started seeing the writing on the wall even in 2019. And so we were preparing for a recession in 2020. And then when they started pumping money in the economy, naturally, they just delayed the inevitable, didn't they? And they actually created a bigger bubble. And that's why they call this like the bubble of all bubbles, right? It's like the everything bubble, everything bubbled up. So get lean. One thing you got to make sure is really look at your, your cash flow situation, your business, your personal life really start to analyze those numbers, start to find out where do you need to cut? You know, where do you need to trim the fat? Where are the things that aren't serving you right now? Uh, I'll tell you that most people, even people that are good savers, don't always track their money. Uh, I use things like, for my business, I'll use QuickBooks, of course, and I'll, and I'll look at that once a week. I'll update my numbers and start to see how the numbers are going, profit and loss. I look at that once a week. Same thing on the personal side, tracking your numbers, making sure that you have, you know, that you know where your money's going. There's been so many times that we've had, credit cards hacked, you know, or debit, I should say credit cards, debit cards, that uh, all of a sudden we have these extra Walmart charges we've never seen had we not tracked our money. One time, it was actually while we moved, we stopped tracking our money for about a month and a half because we're just in transition, all this moving. And guess what? Found out that uh, someone, oops, go back there. Someone had actually, um, I think they withdrew about 1300 bucks. A lot of them just small little Walmart charges that we wouldn't have, we didn't see at first and we ended up having to report it back to the credit union to get our money back. So sometimes it's just, it's not even about you spending money. Sometimes it's just about make sure you are a wise steward. Remember, whatever you pay attention to, whatever you track, whatever you watch will expand and grow. But whatever you ignore will leave you. You know, if you obviously, you know, it's like Jared, he knows this. If you ignore your cattle, just let them eat whatever they're going to eat, you know, especially if it ends up being poisonous, you could lose a good chunk of your flock. In fact, your stewardship will always shrink to whatever you're comfortable with. So be careful when you say, you know, I hate this. You know, when you're not grateful for your blessings, that's when the Lord loves to find ways to show you, uh, you know, really how 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 abundant you really were before, right? So definitely make sure you're you're always being grateful and and looking to expand in the right way when you're 
expanding your stewardship. So get lean, really track that money, understand what's going on. Get liquid. I, I think right now it's funny because most people will say with inflation, they're like, oh, cash is worthless. Don't hold money in cash. Don't have dollars. Put it somewhere else. Whatever the majority of people say, do the opposite. That's what I've learned. Pretty much whatever the opposite of what people say, especially the masses, whatever they say is usually the right answer. It's a, like, you've ever watched Seinfeld? You know, if you ever watched Jerry Seinfeld, there's an episode called Opposite George, where George Costanza, who's generally the loser of the show, right? Um, he decides to do the opposite of what he would normally do and becomes a winner. For just one episode, he becomes a winner, right? And he starts, you know, putting money here and there and everywhere, not putting money, but he starts trying different things, right? So he even got a different sandwich and he ended up meeting just an amazingly hot woman, you know, and then he even gets the job of his dreams with the New York Yankees, which he'd wanted forever. And that was part of the show, right? So just because he did the opposite, he was able to get everything he wanted in life until he went back to good old George and, you know, his life became kind of like George again. Don't be George, right? <laughs> Do the opposite. I think being liquid right now in cash is a key. It doesn't mean we don't invest, but it does mean having a good amount of cash, I think is going to be very, very valuable in this coming year or two. You're going to see people saying, I wish I had cash. And that's where getting out also means too. Getting out can mean, where do I have equity trapped? Where can I get my money out of prison? Do I have money sitting in savings? Maybe an overabundance of it that needs to be used and put somewhere properly so I can actually make some passive income on it? Do I have equity in my properties that maybe aren't serving me right now? Even people we get that are quote unquote real estate investors, we look at their re what's called return on equity. How much cash flow are they getting compared to the equity? It's not good. Uh, I had one guy in California, he had $700,000 of equity in his property. He was cash flowing $200 a month net profit, <laughs> 200. I said, buddy, if we even just sell that California property, which by the way, you know, I, I've been telling people for the last couple of years, sell that California property, get anything on the West Coast, get it out, go look East. Anywhere in the Eastern part of the United States, not the Western half is better. I was like, get it over here. Even if you just make 10% cash and cash return, which is not hard to do with your property, that now changes it, changes it from 2,400 a year, that 200 bucks a month, now to 70,000 a year with that equity. Drastic, drastic difference for him. And again, he thought he was doing everything perfectly well. He was doing his old Dave Ramsey method. But unfortunately, that method doesn't work well if you want to create real wealth. Great if you're just trying to get out of a hole, out of a bad situation. He's awesome with his advice. But if you want to create real wealth and passive income, you got to kind of up level to the next level there. So, so that's what I mean by get lean, get liquid, get out. Find out where you can get those resources to work for you. So you don't have to work so hard for the stinking resources. So... I mentioned this, you know, if someone wants $100,000 cash flow in the next 10 years, you save in a mutual fund, which is only average about 7.7% in the market. Uh, most mutual funds don't even get that much. Uh, they don't usually keep up with the stock market. That's 7%. You have to save $19,400 a month to start pulling out $100,000 of cash flow in 10 years. Uh, easy, right? <laughs> you know, if you get an investment at 10%, now it's a little less than $5,000 a month. If you have an investment like what we're talking about here at 12%, which most of our investments do at least 10, 12, if not more, then you only need to save about 3,700 a month to get to 100,000 in 10 years. Um, that's total return. Uh, and many of my investment properties, most of them are averaging at least 30 to 40% a year total when you factor in everything. But, you know, again, there's no guarantees. You can always have ones that suck. You know, I've had an Alabama property last year that it netted maybe 2% because we had an unexpected costs and things like that. I have other properties, they'll net sometimes 100% a year, things like that. Just depends on what's going on. So, so that's the thing, guys. So uh, at this point, I'm just going to open up for questions. You know, what do you guys have for me now? <clears throat> One question that I tried to answer, but I want to get your answer, Chris, is um, how do you define path or um, where was it? Who asked the question? It was Kayla's. What is the definition of financial freedom? That yeah. One? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's a great question because I, I see this. <laughs> Sorry, we have a we have a flood going on in our basement at the same time too. So not only are you trying to leave town, but we got floods and had a wave of the disaster relief person to say they're done. So, uh, mm -hmm. anyways, financial freedom and financial independence. I see two different definitions. And this is just my definition. You could call it whatever you want. Financial independence. That's where uh, essentially you have enough money coming in of passive income to pay for your basic living expenses. That's financial independence. That's what Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad Poor Dad, would call out of the rat race, right? Financial freedom is a different story. Financial freedom is where I believe that money is no longer the reason or excuse that you do or do not do anything, where money still doesn't dictate your life anymore. 
that one is not just a financial number. And it might be that you go above and beyond that financial independence number. But more importantly, it's a thing that happens up here, right? Um, I've seen people that have millions of dollars and they're still scared to death thinking they'll never have enough. That's that scarcity emotion. Uh, that's one thing we have to work on, that scarcity mindset, you know, and focusing more on the abundant mindset, which is, I believe, is more of a true eternal mindset. But again, we get caught up in that scarcity, you know, it, it just never feels like it's enough. That's why people that are hyper savers, like my dad was, he can never save enough. He can never, even if he paid off all of his debt, it never felt like it was enough, right? It was never enough. You could never save enough. You could never pay off debt fast enough. It was never enough. Even spenders. People that are spenders, they can never make income fast enough because it's easy come, easy go, right? So in those two worlds of scarcity, but if you go in the middle between a steward and a spender, or not a steward and a spender, I just gave away the answer. Between the saver and the spender, if you come in the middle and get out of that scarcity world and go into abundance, that's where the steward lives. The steward says, listen, like I know that money is meant to be used. I'm not an Egyptian going to bury my money in a tomb because it's going to get robbed anyways. I can't take it with me. But what can I do to expand my stewardship, my, not just my money, my gifts, my talents, and everything that I've been blessed with to be able to make people's lives better? That's what a steward does. They always look to expand and grow their stewardship, even their financial stewardship. And it doesn't mean you have to expand it to billions of dollars, like I said. It might just be that you get it to a certain point and say, I'm good. And, uh, and everybody's different. It's a different call, value call that way. Thank you for that. You probably re can read Sean's question, but I think this is really good. It would apply also to um, maybe uh, what are the other ones? 401ks or other types of IRAs where you're penalized if you take it out early. How would can you read that question? OK. Yeah, because really, Sean and Justin's cool. question do tie in nicely together. It's interesting. And they both reference Dave Ramsey as well. Right. Um, yeah. Talking about never touching your retirement and Roth IRAs versus IRAs. So I'm going to talk about both because Roth IRAs and IRAs have different tax rules. Um, you know, if you realize with Roth IRAs, the reason people love them is because you put after tax dollars in, grows tax free, comes out tax free, at least after 59 and a half. If you try to touch it before you're 59 and a half, there is a 10% penalty on your money. And that's true with even IRAs as well. But IRAs, you do it pre tax. It's like the 401k, right? I mean, they're all essentially the same tax rules where you put in pre-tax money, you don't get taxed now, but then when you pull it out, you get taxed later. And there's that debate about, well, is it better to save on taxes today or do I save on taxes later? Um, and the debate, you know, it's, it's kind of like, a, <laughs> I remember when I used to work for corporate America, uh, I was, I remember the uh, human resource lady, she was definitely in her thirties and, uh, and she was telling us why the 401k was the best thing since sliced bread, right? She's trying to tell us all of us should be putting into that plan and she's saying, it's going to be great, guys, because you don't get taxed on it now. But when you get old, you don't really spend money when you're old because old people don't really do anything. And so you want to pay, you want to save on taxes now. So then you don't, so then you just pay taxes later when you're, you just live on nothing. And I remember thinking, I, I, was, I was only about in my early 20s. I thought, that sounds stupid to me. And, it, and it's true. It was. I mean, and she really did talk like that, by the way. Um, <laughs> she was not the brightest person to be managing our 401ks. Uh, but needless to say, uh, that's the problem is that, you know, the, uh, I think the likelihood is even if tax rates stay the same, just because of inflation, because we have to pull out more money in the future anyways, because the dollar just becomes worth less and less. It's like they just keep adding. It's like adding water to your orange juice. Just because it's orange doesn't mean it's orange juice anymore, right? It's the same thing with our dollar. And so if inflation drives that up, should, even if they keep tax rate the same, you still have to pull out more money just to survive. That could put you in a higher tax bracket. Plus, you do lose a lot of your deductions, especially with children moving out. If you well, hopefully they move out. Depends if they launch or not. Um, you've got uh, you've got, of course, you know things like your mortgage interest. Well, if you do the the whole method of becoming debt free, well, you lost the interest on your mortgage to write that off, and maybe you have some charitable deductions, but you don't have much to really write off later unless you have a business, of course. Um, so that is a debate. And there's times where they could both work. Um, but, here's the, but here's what it really comes down to. So when we get clients with IRAs or Roth IRAs, Roth IRAs are easier to access first. So if I have a client that has both an IRA and maybe they have a Roth IRA, the first place we'll go to is the Roth. The reason being is whatever you've put into a Roth IRA, that money you can pull out with no penalty, no taxes, right? Uh, in fact, any of the money you pull out of the Roth, there are no taxes because you already pay those taxes up front. But if you pull out that money before you're 59 and a half, any gains in that Roth IRA is a 10% penalty. 
that early withdrawal penalty. No taxes, but there is a 10% penalty. Um, and the same is true with even IRAs, but if you pull out from an IRA or a 401k, you get the 10% penalty plus the income tax as well on top of it. Both can be done. So usually Roth IRA will go for first and we might just pull out the, what they call the cost basis, right? How much you've actually put in. We might pull that out, avoid any taxes, use that to invest. Um, and, and I'd like to, if I'm going to do that, invest in places where there are tax advantages, things like rental real estate, like those turnkeys, because of depreciation, I can usually offset and not pay any taxes on my rentals, which I love. So it's essentially still tax free, but now I, at least I can invest it however I want. IRA money is a little trickier or 401k money. It's a little trickier. You can access this, but um, you will pay 10% penalty plus taxes, right? So it has to be worth it if we're going to do that. Um, and there are times that we do. I've had people even in their early 50s say, you know what? Like, this is slowing me down. If I get this money now, I can get closer to my goal much more quickly. Even after I pay the tax and penalty, I can still, it's almost like you're in the slow lane driving on the freeway and you, and you get stuck behind that semi. And, you're, and you know, hopefully it's not when you guys drive that semi, I get stuck behind, but you're driving that semi, right? And, or that tree, you know, and you get stuck behind them and you know that there's cars passing on the left. You might be willing to slow down, brake a little bit, just so you can get behind that car to get in that lane and go faster. That's how I see the IRA. It's like, maybe I have to put on the brakes, lose a little bit in the beginning, but if it gets me in the faster lane where I make more money and I have more income coming in, it's worth it, right? Again, there's always case by case in this situation because the other option is you can do what's called a self-directed IRA or self-directed Roth IRA where you just leave it in the IRA structure, but you get to invest it however you want. And now it's still an IRA. It'll still get taxed if it's just an IRA. It's self-directed, but it means you don't have to be in the stock market. You can go and invest in any of those syndications. You can lend money with it, even though it's a little trickier with lending. Uh, but most of those funds or syndications that you're looking at, real estate properties, you have to be careful. There could be some extra taxes you got to be careful of if you don't do it right. But you can pretty much invest almost in almost anything with an IRA. Uh, and that's what's not taught by financial advisors. Why? Uh, because if you decide to move that money and go invest in some of these alternative investments like we've been talking about, guess how much money the, the financial advisor makes if you do that? Zero, right? They make money when you put it in their mutual funds. So, and by the way, because they can only recommend mutual funds because their licenses, I know I used to have it. You can only recommend mutual funds. Naturally, what are they going to say if you say, I'm thinking about putting this money in real estate? Guess what the financial advisor will say? Nah, nah, that's risky. And besides, real estate doesn't make any money. Nobody makes money in real estate. You don't want to repeat a last recession, do you? They'll say all that kind of stuff to keep you in. While in 2022, you lost 20% of your money in the stupid stock market, right? That's what they're going to say. And of course, they still get paid, don't they? They still get paid whether you make money in the stock market or not. They're making money on your money. So, um, so just know that there are plenty of options with the IRAs or Roth IRAs. Um, whether you self-direct it or you cash it out just depends on the situation, the timeline and your age and goals, all that stuff. Perfect. Great question, by the way. Yeah, that was good. I think bottom line is depends, but um, so <clears throat> we probably better cut off questions there. Yeah. Um, our next speaker is on deck and ready to go. But Chris, how do people get a hold of you? What would be a good next step if they are interested in learning more about what you have to offer? specific around passive and investing and things. Yeah, you can always go to our website, moneyripples.com. Uh, we got lots of education on there, plenty of stuff there. Um, to answer Ben's question, you can also follow our podcast, um, which is also on YouTube. I actually just had a podcast, it definitely released today, even though it says yesterday, about 2023 and my projections of what I see is going to happen. Uh, I actually answered your question, that very question, Ben. So um, definitely check that out. Check out our podcast on YouTube, iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the Money Ripples podcast. And yeah, yeah, I usually watch them on YouTube, even though I just am driving around listening. But it's, same here. <laughs> it's a good way. Well, Chris, thank you so very much for coming. Um, I think this is a timely message for all of us, right? I mean, there's never a, <clears throat> never a wrong time to start something. You know, it would have been better had we started 20 years ago, right? But it's better to start today than, than not start at all. So thanks. I hope this has expanded everyone's mind a little bit to realize that as stewards, um, we're not just responsible for growing grass and cows, right? We can, we can grow our money as well, and we can do it responsibly, and we can do it in a way so that we create that freedom that Chris talked about, right? So that um, if we want to, 
you know, if we want to take a year off, like Alan talked about yesterday, we can do that. We're not relying upon the paycheck that we get from our own businesses um, to be able to do the things that we want to do. So thank you, Chris Miles. All right. <clears throat> Very good. Very good. Well, we have our next speaker loaded up, ready to go. This has kind of been fast and furious today, you guys. Um, again, if you need to go take a break, um, do that, get a drink of water. But as I introduce this next speaker, um, I want to just ask the question. So we haven't asked this yet, and this will kind of help Jarrett to know maybe where to gear his comments. But um, can you guys give us um, like a brief description of what your current enterprises are? And if you're not familiar with that term, what do you raise on your ranches? Um, I, I realize some of you may not be doing something. So for us, we have custom grazing cattle. We direct market grass-fed beef, and we have a small cow-calf herd. Those would be the three things that we're doing. So if you'll just type that into the chat, if you are involved in production agriculture, like what are the things that you are currently doing? And we'll give you just a minute to do that. That'll really, that'll really kind of help us and um, help everybody to gain a, an understanding also of what you do, where you do. Um, so we are honored to have Jarrett Hammond here where here with us today. He is pinch hitting for Cam King. Jarrett and Cam work together in um, grass-fed marketing, and they are the experts at helping people to be able to crack the code on how to direct market. It's the best way I can say it, because I think a lot of us try. Some of us are pretty good at it. I know the Cunninghams are on here. Um, I see their stuff. I think they're knocking it out of the park, but it's hard. And face it, we most of us didn't get into agriculture because we like people, right? We're kind of reclusive. We want to be where we where we are and not have to worry about interfacing with people. But yet now we're starting this business where we've got to go and stand at farmers markets. We got to post on social media. We got to do these things that are uncomfortable for us. And man, we usually we really stink at it. Some of us are super good, but my I know that for me it is a stretch to be able to stand there and sell beef. And I've done it, but there's an easier way. And uh, Jarrett and Cam have got that way. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, direct marketing made easy, about what works, what doesn't work, um, about maybe the next steps. And so that would be the next question. If you haven't put in there, like how many of you are direct marketing um, currently? And are you direct marketing just beef? Are you direct marketing um, lamb, eggs, vegetables, produce, um, your kids? Um, I haven't had very good luck with them. You know, still got them around here. But sometimes they've got to be an enterprise for all these kids that we have around here. Just joking aside, no, they, they earn their keep. So, all right, Jarrett, um, he's a, he is like a world famous copywriter. If you don't know what that is, that means that he knows how to get messages in front of people that are read, right? And there's an there's a whole art and a science to how to do that. So listen up, everybody. Hopefully this resonates. Even if you're not in direct marketing, all of us have a product that we need to sell. And I think all of us can do better at doing that. So run with it, Jared. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jared. Um, we just love you guys. You and Selena are solid people. Just want to to honor you real quick. I know that's uncomfortable, but um, that's why when you reached out to Cam, he was really excited about doing this. And I have to extend uh, Cam's disappointment that he couldn't make it today. But anyway, my name is Jarrett, and I am the marketing director for a coaching company called Grassfed Marketing. And we do exactly what Jared said. We work with uh, farm to table producers typically meat producers. However, we've worked with people who sell honey or any, any types of crops, really, if they really want to sell direct to consumer, we teach them how to kind of make that transition. And we've seen some incredible results with people because we use very specific type of marketing that I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. So if you're interested in how to sell direct to consumer through the internet, 
even if you're tech challenged, even if you hate your computer, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And so I'm just, I'm really excited to talk about this stuff. Um, yeah, we're going to nerd out for just a little bit. Um, if you have questions at the end, I'm going to enjoy uh, taking some of those. I'll, I'll say off the bat, uh, some of the things we believe about marketing and, and what it means uh, to be a producer is controversial. And I'm going to say things that it's going to be challenging to our mindset today, but that's where growth is. So when you allow your mind to be offended and be, to be introduced to some of these ideas that I'm going to share, that's where the progress is. That's where acceleration is in our business. That being said, I'm good natured. Uh, I love farmers. Uh, I love the animals. And so that's why we do what we do. And so with that, uh, let's, let's get rolling. So, and I do want to say, I don't, I don't have anything to sell you today. There's not, I'm not going to have a pitch at the end. Um, if anything, I'll be giving away some free resources to help you out. Cause like I said, we're, we're an acquired taste. We're maybe not for everybody, but I do want to share some ideas that will help you sell your product uh, direct to consumer. And so, yeah, with that, there's a startling statistic that says 13% of what we would call a farm to table meat producer, just 13% actually earn a full-time livable income from their work. Now, maybe not everybody wants to earn a full-time income, but if you're here uh, joining us on this summit, it's because you have your finger on wanting to make a full-time income uh, from your work and from your effort and from your premium product. And it's, no, it's uh, no secret that farming and farmers are under attack. We are living, we're really not living in a farm age yet we always need farming. And so there's this quote from John F. Kennedy that says, uh, the farmer is the only man in our economy who buys everything at retail sells everything at wholesale and pays freight both ways. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't sound true, then you haven't been in the business very long. And we're here to change the narrative on that, help you um, take the power back as a farmer and as a producer, um, here to rally the troops and really form a rebellion of regenerative farmers who are saying no to some of the ways that farming has been done conventionally through the years to say no to lower prices, to say no uh, to the masses and, and kind of do what Chris said, do the opposite. We're gonna do uh, opposite George in the farming industry. And so um, that's what I'm starting with. That's really our, our position on the thing here. So hopefully you all wanna join the rebellion with me. And, and here's what that looks like in terms of selling your product direct to consumer. So first we have to realize what business it is that we are actually in. So we started by asking, hey, what do you raise? What's your product? Like I'm a cow-calf operation. We're, we're raising, you know, we're, we're growing row crops, you know, we have poultry. And I would argue with you on that. Um, you're not in the cattle business. You're not in the pork or poultry business. You're actually in the marketing business because it doesn't matter how good your product is. And most of us here, if we care about regenerative agriculture, our product is not only good, it doesn't only have an incredible flavor profile, incredible texture. It's not just healing for the human body. It's not just healing for families and for the environment. It is about the marketing. We have a premium product that literally could change the world if done the way we believe what should be done. But it doesn't matter how good our product is if we can't sell it if we can't market it. Now, the S word, sales, tends to be a dirty word, right? No one wants to be a salesman, right? It's salesman is up there with car dealer and politician, right? It's just a reviled term. But we think, from our standpoint, we think of selling as a service. So if we believe that we're raising our product in a way that's healing for the planet, healing for the human body, then we're actually doing a service when we sell somebody something. And we have to approach all of this from that standpoint. Otherwise, lines get blurred, things can feel icky, 
we could start thinking less of ourselves and less of our product. And, and that'll show up in some pretty dangerous ways. So before we get started, selling is a service. In fact, um, in the Icelandic language, the same word for service is the same word for selling. So there are cultures who believe that when you sell somebody something, you're serving them. You're doing something that's beneficial for them. And like I said, if we're raising the product the way um, Jared's teaching and the people he's bringing on to speak, then we're doing a major service for the planet, a major service for families and, and people who really need what it is we're producing. So let's not sell ourselves short here. We're not talking about if we're a commodity, we know straight up, we have a premium product and we wanna serve those who we can serve at, at a very high level. But that means the business we're actually in is not the business of the animals. It's not in the business of the production. We're, we have to be in the business of marketing first. Before I lose all of us, please hold on to what I'm saying before we keep going here. So um, how, is, how do we market? Like, what does marketing mean? It's such a broad term. You can't get any expert to really agree on it. There's, there's like the five P's of marketing that they teach in college that doesn't apply in the real world. Um, there's, you know, marketers are in, on Main Street when they're small business. Like, what is a marketer? Who is a marketer? Well, I want to break down by what we mean when we say we coach people on how to market direct to consumer. And really, I think of marketing in two different schools of thought. Number one is um, what's called brand marketing. And this is the one we're all pretty familiar with. It's the whole idea of I just need to get my name out there to sell more. I just need to get my name out there. Maybe I'll print up some business cards. Maybe we'll sponsor the local T-ball league. Maybe we'll run an ad in the local paper or circular, or maybe we'll get real crazy and run some spot ads on local radio. That is just getting your name out there, which is called brand advertising. Now, brand advertising, brand marketing is done by companies like McDonald's, right? Everybody knows McDonald's. We all recognize the golden arches. They've had decades of building that image and building their brand to the point where it costs them $459 million a year just to advertise. So if you're trying to sell your product, you're not just competing with your neighbor. You're not just competing at the local farmer market. You're competing for everyone's mouth the decision they make of what they eat and stuff down their throat. That's what you're competing against. So I say McDonald's and you say, oh yeah, well, we're not like them. They're, they're, buying, they're buying cargo products. Well, I hate to tell you, anytime somebody makes a decision on what's for dinner, you're competing with that decision. So the fact that there is a company out there spending $459 million to advertise to people who eat food means very likely is that you're not able to compete with McDonald's. And so when we say you need to advertise, we're not saying get your name out there. If you don't have $459 to play that game, uh, it's just not going to work. So how can we essentially compete? Now we're not really competing with McDonald's. Um, you know, that's Burger King's job, I guess. That's Wendy's job. But we are competing with a decision people make when it comes to food. And so just getting our name out there is like peeing in the wind, right? It's, it's going nowhere. It's going all over. It's not measurable. You can't get it into a cup. Okay, so um, that's not the type of marketing we want to do. When I say marketing, I'm referring to a very specific way of turning somebody who's a stranger into somebody who connects with you and they, they learn to like you, they learn to know you, they learn to trust you with a purchase. And there's a strategy behind that. There's a way to do that well on a budget. There's a way to do that well that helps your income become more predictable each and every month. And we call that type of marketing direct response marketing. And it's just as it sounds. We're looking for a direct response, response from the people we are marketing to. We either want them to get through our marketing and say, heck yes, or just as helpful, heck no, and then move on. And so that's a strategy. That's not Nike spending $3 billion a year 
so that somebody knows what a blurry check mark means on their shoe. This is very specifically, here's who we are, here's who we serve, here's how to, to work with us, yes or no. So that's kind of the philosophy behind how to market direct to consumer. We do it through what's called direct response advertising or direct response marketing. If we get nothing else out of my long-winded talk today, start Googling what direct response marketing is and look into who's doing direct response marketing and how you can tailor it in your business. Um, so that's kind of like the first thing behind the, the rest of what I'm going to say. It's kind of like if you're wearing a button up shirt and you're getting dressed in the dark, you miss that first button and you go down the rest of the way, your shirt's crooked, nothing's going to work. So getting this first button of what I'm talking about is direct response marketing to uh, direct to direct consumer. Um, that's going to make everything line up and make more sense as we move forward. So as I'm saying marketing, I'm not saying just get your name out there. I'm saying converting a stranger into a buyer, turning them into a raving fan who sticks around, who refers family and friends, and who anytime you have something to offer, they're making a purchase or at least heavily considering making a purchase. So that's a very different strategy. So how do we do that? We do that by beginning with the who, not the what or the how. When you are wanting to plan an effective marketing strategy, you don't start with, here's what I have, here's how I'm raising it, here's how I'm going to get it to everybody, here's all the logistics. We actually need to start with who. Who is it that we want to serve? Remember, not just sell to, who is it that we really, really can serve? Um, and to do, to really answer that question, I want to, I think I'm going to share my screen. And no, I don't need to do that. It'd be confusing if I did that because the document is so big, we couldn't, so we couldn't fit it all in one spot. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mention who we've identified as a who you could choose from to serve. Here's what that looks like. So in our coaching company, we've identified actually six buyer types who prefer, who if they knew the option existed, would want to buy directly from their farmer. Um, you know, it's funny. I live in a really rural area. My family has raised blueberries since I was four years old. Uh, there's dairy farms all over. I'm in Southwest Michigan. So I live in the fruit belt and farms everywhere. Everybody around here, they're either shooting their deer and feeding their family that way, or they're buying direct from the farmer. But if you drive an hour away from here to bigger cities, or if you drive a few hours away from here to Chicago or a little bit further to Detroit, most consumers don't know that they could buy healthier, better quality food directly from a farmer. Now, in some of the more hipster areas, uh, there's farmer markets, farm markets where it's cool to go and spend more on stuff, but there's less quantity and a ton of people, everybody sells out. It's just kind of a fun thing to do to drink, you know, get an overpriced coffee and go look at what all the farmers have. Not a super effective strategy from, from where we live, but you know, there are people who, if they knew you had this product, if they knew you could purchase from a farmer, they would do it. Uh, case in point, there are several apple orchards where we live and we're about an hour and 15 from downtown Chicago. And so wealthy executives, high income earners, they, they like to make the trip to come up here in the fall and pick their own apples and drive them back home. So they get the idea. There's some that get the idea that, oh, it's colorful in the fall. Let's get away from these skyscrapers and this concrete jungle. Let's see how everybody else lives. Okay. And then they come up here and it's a novel thing. They can buy direct from uh, a farmer, their own fruit. Few probably know that just a few miles down the road, we have um, we have a cattle farm where they're producing their own beef that they could buy at, with retail cuts or get a, a hamburger uh, subscription mailed directly to them every month or buy a, a, a cow share, a quarter, half or whole. So um, most of what we're battling is if people just knew what we had, they would buy it. But Again, we have identified six customer types, six primary customer types who are who would actively purchase 
your product from you directly if they knew it was an option. And, and let's talk about who they are. There's very few outside of these six major categories or out of these six categories that exist. Everyone is kind of some version of what I'll share with you. And so um, just let's begin. Here are six customer types. These are the who behind the what and the how. So let's begin with who. Uh, customer type number one, we call her Keto Kelly. This is somebody who is looking to, to for a cleaner protein source or a cleaner food source. This is somebody that's eating keto or paleo or doing Whole30. This is somebody who is really serious about nutrition. Maybe she does Pilates or yoga, but she definitely has some sort of gym, uh, uh, gym membership somewhere. And she's all about eating whole foods and um, cares about her health and her body. And that's our first customer type, Keto Kelly. The second customer type is who we call Lauren the foodie. Maybe she and her husband like to entertain. They invite family and friends over often. They cook elaborate meals or they like to go out and spend a ton of money on food and wine or other adult beverages. And that's their thing. Their whole hobby, everything they're interested in, all of their disposable income goes to food. They watch, um, they watch Food Network all day. The, she's looking up recipes on Pinterest. Uh, she's always trying new things in the kitchen. This is Lauren the foodie. Um, we, you would probably recognize them as a snobbier type of consumer who likes to just spend more money than necessary on food or more than what we would spend on food. Uh, but there's also the other side of that, and that's customer type number three. His name is Brant the Grilling Enthusiast. Brant the Grilling Enthusiast. This is a little bit more of my speed. This is probably a man in his 40s or approaching 40 or 50s. He probably listens to the Joe Rogan podcast. He probably has a trigger and he probably smokes meat on the weekends for fun, gets up early, tries his own rubs, makes his own sauces, or probably hates sauce because it's all about the meat, not the sauce, right? Has strong opinions that way. This is Brant the Grilling Enthusiast. These guys are always looking for a better flavor profile. They're always looking for texture. They always want to pay more money because they know grocery store meat just doesn't cut it. It just doesn't cut it. So that's Brant the Grilling Enthusiast. Um, and then the next one is Deanna, the community cheerleader. Deanna, the community cheerleader. Now, she would be recognized as the unofficial mayor of her town. She knows where all the hot spots are. She's all about the local football team. She's the one showing up at those farmer's markets, maybe even organizes the farmer's market. She's all about her community. And if there is a small business in, in her community, she's telling everyone in her social circle. She's on Facebook, telling all of her friends, sharing links. She's all about her hometown goodness that she's super proud of. And she'll spend more because she doesn't want to support the Walmarts. She doesn't want to drive outside of her area. She wants it to be all about her hometown. And so she's a great one too. And the next two, the last two, um, number four, Patty the Planner. Sorry, number five, Patty the Planner. Patty the Planner is usually a mom, a very busy mom, maybe a, even a homeschool mom who's raising a number of kids, always on the go with piles and mountains of laundry, always having to run kids to dance, to football, all these different sports activities stay engaged at the local church. Maybe there's youth group. Maybe she's in her own small group or book club. She's a busy mama, but she cares about the health of her family. She cares uh, about making sure everybody's getting all their extracurriculars in and they're, they're staying active and healthy, but she also wants to provide healthy, healthy meals and probably more times than she'd like to admit uh, when groceries get low, she's the one running through McDonald's. All right, everybody get what you want. So sorry, we didn't have groceries ready. I had a lot going on today. We can kind of feel the busyness and the, the hectic schedule of that kind of mom and that kind of family, an active family. But more often than not, family first, which means health first, which means mealtime matters, which means gathering around the table for a meal is important. And so 
Patty the planner is all about meal planning, meal prepping, and making sure she has everything she needs to provide a healthy meal, quick and easy uh, on those busy nights. And so she's a strong one. She's a strong one on that. And then the last one, one of my personal favorite customer types is Kathy healing through food. Kathy, maybe she has an autoimmune problem. Maybe she uh, is diabetic. Maybe she's having these weird reactions to her food and she's in the middle of an elimination diet. What can I not eat versus what I can't eat at this point, right? So she's having some kind of issues. Maybe she's trying to figure out what's going on with these gout flare-ups. They seem to make no sense. Um, maybe she's having gut or digestion issues and nothing she eats seems to, to agree with her, with her stomach. This is a really important one because the way most of us are raising our product would help her problem. It would heal her body. It would help her enjoy the foods she used to love that she's finding she just can't eat when she gets it from Walmart or Kroger or Meyer or wherever you're located. And so she's in a really bad place. It's hard to get all the nutrients she needs uh, because she's eliminating so many things. Um, food just doesn't taste as good because there's so many seasonings she can't have. She's in a miserable, miserable spot. And so she needs to, she needs you. She needs you to get yourself in front of where she's at with the right offer at the right time. So she can start enjoying life again. So she can start healing her body um, through food. And so that's one of my favorite ones. And so just a quick rundown again, because I know I'm just kind of throwing these out here, but um, again, there's six customer types. We want to begin with who we can best serve, who it makes sense for us to serve. And that's Keto Kelly, who has got a gym membership. She's Maybe she's on carnivore diet, Whole30, Keto, Paleo. And so she's buying food to fit within her nutritional needs as she works out and works on her body. Lauren, the foodie is just about the food. Maybe she's not a keto Kelly. Maybe Lauren, the foodie is a little bit chunkier like me because she's all about throwing down for extra food. She, she likes to spend money at all the nicest restaurants. She likes entertaining family and friends, inviting them to dinner parties, cooking wild recipes. She's found on um, uh, Pinterest. So Lauren, the foodie, her entire life, her entire hobby, everything is all about food. And she's willing to pay more to enjoy it. Um, Brant, the grilling enthusiast, he is all about buying meat with the right flavor, flavor profile, the right texture that he can smoke on the weekend while he might be enjoying a cigar, um, might enjoy a local, uh, a local whiskey, you know, uh, and he's really into World War II documentaries, right? So this is Brant, the grilling enthusiast. Um, that was pretty specific, but I know Brant really well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deanna, the community cheerleader, she is all about everything local to her community. She's the one that would be protesting uh, uh, an Amazon fulfillment center in her community. She's the one that is complaining about Walmart, you know, stomping out all of the local mom and pop stops. She's all about her community, strengthening that community, supporting and spending money within her community. And she brings everyone else with her. Uh, there's Patty the planner. She's a busy mom. They're a busy family. She cares about the health of her family. Um, she, but to, in order to do that well, she she buys food in bulk. She plans the meals. She preps the meals uh, to keep their active lifestyle going. And then the last one is Kathy, who's healing herself with food. She's having real issues in her body that she knows. Um, she's on an elimination diet, most likely. She's avoiding the foods that she really loves. She's pretty miserable. And our product can heal her body if she knew about it and if it was presented to her. Okay, so we're beginning with who. These are our six customer types. Now, we probably resonated a little bit with each one of those. We understood who they were, the problems they have, the way our product could solve it for them. But here's the thing. If you're marketing, it is really hard to, especially the way we do it, to communicate to each and every one of these, especially as we're getting started. It's more important, it's more effective, and it's easier to communicate with just one customer type. See, right now, a lot of us, if we're dipping our toe in the 
direct to consumer space. We're just trying to shotgun the approach. Who wants it? I've got it. Who wants it? I've got it. But we really need to, just like a laser, focus in on one of these customer types and communicate with their language, communicate with their fears, with their needs, with their wants, with their dreams. We need to be able to communicate with them and resonate with them in a way that it's like we know them as well as we know the back of our hand. That's how we communicate through marketing messaging in a way that's effective enough to cut through the noise of everybody else that's vying for their attention, the JBS, the Cargo, the Tyson, any of those options, right? We need to be able to cut through the noise and speak directly to her. And so before I get too far in that, um, that's it. Let's, let's just pick one, one of the major buyer types. Maybe we do that by, as I was saying these uh, out loud, maybe, maybe you kind of felt oppressing in yourself. Like I could serve that person. I want to help heal the Cathy's of the world, or I know what it's like to be a Patty the planner. We are an active family that cares about health, but sometimes, you know, we don't quite, you know, it's funny. I used to run into my uh, family along at my local grocer. It was always the mom, the dad, or the oldest daughter. Every time I'd run into the store, it'd be one of them. And they used to say, we don't, don't, we don't go grocery shopping. We go dinner getting. It's not about what we're buying. It's about what we needed to finish the meal. So they had a very different philosophy about how they got the groceries. Well, Patty the Planner, right? That's Patty the Planner is stuck in that when she doesn't have everything lined up and planned and has control over her schedule. And so, you know, which one of these resonates with you? And so, yeah, it's just, it's just really important that we zero it in because we can't communicate with everybody. And honestly, not everybody's our customer. Not everybody's our customer. Um, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more. Why isn't everybody our customer if everybody needs to eat? This is where, this is where it gets a little more controversial because we're, we're farmers. We love uh, supporting others. We like playing that supporting role. A lot of us um, are people of faith. We believe in serving others and laying our life down for the sake of others. But that's really hard to do when it's our income. And so here's a couple of things here. We'll hit a little bit more of this later, but we can't serve everybody. That's an Apostle Paul thing. That's, I, I you know, I, I serve everybody so that I might reach some. Well, in the case of farming, that's your spiritual life. Now, in, in agriculture and in business, we're actually more effective when we focus in on the sum. We can actually serve more because it's a matter of reaching them and pulling them into our ecosystem and into our business. We're going to hit a little bit more on this later. But not everybody with a pulse and a credit card can be our customer because we can't reach that many people. We can't financially afford to do it. We don't have the platform to do it. And so when we zero in on one customer type and go all in, uh, that's when we start seeing results. And so maybe you've been marketing direct to consumer for a while and you're thinking like, well, how, how do I do this now that we're already neck deep in this? Well, I would do an audit. Who are your best customers outside of family and friends? Like the, the people that are, you know, three and four and five and six people away from you, not a neighbor, not a family member who's just supporting, but the people who found you independently or the people in the past that you've reached out to, how the ones that went from stranger into your actual business, who are they? And which of these customer types do you see them as, or that you could assume they are, right? And so that's how we begin. Who's the most of those you have? How did you find them? How did they find you? And let's start kind of reverse engineering the successes and the wins that we've had up until now you might see that you have um, a disproportionate number of one of these customer types, which means they're connecting with your product, they're connecting with who you are, they're connecting with your farmer ranch at, at, a, at, a, at mass, or at least at a level where you know this is already working unconsciously, so then we're gonna turn it into our strategy. So maybe that's where you start. Or maybe as you're reading through these six customer types, you are resonating with one that you're like, I want to help alleviate the problems in this customer type's life. That's my heart. 
that's what I felt when, when I was introduced to this concept and that's who I want to go after. And so that's where we start. So we're beginning with who. So now let's kind of dive into the how. So how is it? All right, we've identified who they are. They're not going to just magically jump into the boat. So hmm. what do we do? Okay. How do we get them? Well, hey, yeah. This is, this is awesome. Can we probably to respect people's time, probably better go like 10 to 15 more minutes. Um, does that, does that work for you? Yeah. Cause otherwise I'd have to take like a few more hours and I, I know I <laughs> couldn't handle a few more hours. Much less. You're so, on a roll. And that's why we, that's why we, I, man, I strongly encourage jumping into the program. Um, it is well worth the investment if you are committed to direct marketing. So I know a few people have had to jump off and this is being recorded. And I will get the recording out to all of you, um, but just to honor people's time, if we can, if we can do that without, without cutting you mid sentence and cutting you off too short. <laughs> yeah, no, in fact, where I was, where I was headed next, really broad stroke here, the, the best way to really, once you identify the who, it's the mechanism of the how, like what's our sales engine. Okay. Handling a lot of this mindset stuff on the front end is already going to put you leaps and bounds ahead. But then what's that mechanism? Like, how is it that we're taking them to a sale and actually transacting? And, and that's where I would encourage us. We really want to get into email marketing, email marketing. And so this is where it gets fun. So I said email, and there's probably some of us on here are like email. Who's still doing that as a, a business strategy? Or there's some of us on who are thinking like email. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not getting into all that tech. Like that's a newfangled technology. Why, why would we do that? So a couple of things here. Email marketing. This is why email marketing is important. First of all, it's not a new technology. Email's actually been around. The first email was sent in 1971. So if we're not doing email marketing, we're, we're kind of late to the party. Now, email marketing has evolved through the years, of course. But right now, as it stands, 50% of all adults make a purchase via email every month, each and every month. That means half of anybody that's old enough to give you a credit card or a debit card um, or buy their own groceries, half of them are purchasing through email already. So we need to get in their inbox so they can actually start transacting with us. But here's the next part. That's 50% of all adults. That's back to the whole mass marketing brand advertising, image advertising, but 85% of all farm to table products sell, sold direct to consumer are sold through email, not the farmer's market, not through a wholesale deal, not through consignment, 85% of all farm to table products are actually sold via email. And so we, we kind of need to get to the point, get to the place where you're like, yeah, get to the point already. <laughs> we need to get to the place where we are building an email list of potential customers. The number one asset in your business is not the acreage you have, is not your employees, although that's a nice sentiment. The number one asset isn't even the animals. It's not even the tractors, even though sometimes that really, sometimes it costs more than our house, right? The number one asset in your business is a customer list or a list of potential customers that you've created in-house. You're not buying a list of contacts. You're attracting one of the six customer types into your business so that you can then send them an offer consistently and start building sales predictably each and every month. Now, if you, you're wondering like, well, okay, we get this far. Maybe you even have emails right now of, of customers who want to do business with you. So what email am I sending? What email am I supposed to send? I'm not a writer, not a copywriter. I'm not a marketer yet. So what do I send? Uh, well, there's two emails I recommend. And this might be a case, Jared, where I give you documents that you can send to people if, if they want them. But the first, the first thing you send is every Friday, every Friday, send a newsletter. Let them know what life on the farm looks like this week. Let people know what shipping is looking like or delivery or when you're available for people to come pick up. But send a newsletter. 
you know, I mentioned earlier, people from Chicago are coming into to my hometown and they're all excited about life on the farm. What do you guys do when we're not here? What's this like? Oh, I wish I could live this lifestyle. What are you guys doing here? How do you make this taste so good? Or how, what are the benefits I'm having? Send them a newsletter, show them what, peel back the curtain, you know, show them what it's like, what's happening, how you're doing things differently. Um, there's more on this. In fact, I have a resource that I'm going to get to you guys. That's so simple to get started. It's literally copy and paste. You fill out one little section here, you fill out the section there, and suddenly you're sharing important things like, Hey, we have this product available, go buy it. Or, Hey, we have a recommendation. We found that grilling peaches taste so good. You can grill a peach and eat it. And it's almost like throwing together a cobbler without all the hassle in the kitchen. Or you know what? It tastes really good on pork, pulled pork. So you're just, you're showing up in their lives in a way that connects with them. Maybe you're like, hey, studies are showing that when you eat grass finished beef, it's actually better for your kidneys if you're having kidney problems. So they say, eat the DASH diet, stay away from red meat if you're having kidney problems, but actually grass finished meat is reversing those problems that they're having in their body. Studies are showing. So that would appeal to a Catholic who needs to heal herself with food. So this is what you wanna do each and every week. Every Friday, very consistently, you're showing up, positioning yourself as the expert. You're showing up in their life in a way that they need to hear from you, they need to receive from you, and they're excited to do that. And so that's what we recommend. Jared's gonna get you that resource because it's absolutely incredible. And I'll end with this. Um, as we're going through here, um, I'm talking about sales. I'm talking about marketing. I'm saying we have a high quality product. It's a premium product. Our prices probably should go up um, because you deserve to earn an income. You deserve to earn a great income. Part of what we want to do at Grassfed Marketing, and I don't know if we'll see it in our lifetime, but one of the things we care about, one of our missions is we want to change the narrative around what it means to be a farmer. Like these days when you ask a kid, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? They say things like, I want to play in the NBA. I want to be a, 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 a hip hop artist. I want to be a doctor. We want people to say, we want even kids to say, I want to be rich. So I'm going to be a farmer. That's what we would like people to say in the next 10 or 20 years. And, and the way to do that is to help people see the value in what we do and why we do it and how we do it. And so the dilemma, this is what I'm wrapping with. The dilemma ends with, well, then I can't help anybody because they can't afford my product. And so I actually, we get this a lot with our private clients. Cause like I said, a lot of us, you know, we're Bible believers, we're people of faith, or we're just really want to help people because we have an empathy that others don't have because we're so close to, to our animals and so close to nature. We just connect with people a little bit differently and we want to serve. So this kept coming up. I can't raise my prices. I can't send all these offers because not everybody can afford to work with us and to do business with us. And so there was this pastor in, in Georgia, massive church, massive church. But all, you know, when you go to church, you expect your pastor to do some things besides give you a book report on Sunday, right? You want a little bit more out of your pastor. You want a relationship. But there's thousands of people at this church. He can't do all the weddings, can't do all the funerals, can't do all the marriage counseling, can't shake all the hands, kiss all the babies. Uh, you know, he just can't be there for everything. So his philosophy is, well, I'll do for one what I wished I could do for absolutely everybody. I'll do that one wedding to really serve. I'll do that one funeral to honor that and celebrate that life. Um, I'll counsel that one couple and give them everything I can, show them how to have a godly marriage. And so it's the idea that you can do for one person what you wish you could do for everybody. If that means you're giving them a whole beef and gifting them a freezer, that's what it means. If it means you're sending them a bundle of whatever your product is every month, that's what it means. You can't do it for everybody, but the quality of which you serve that one family or that one person would far outweigh for them uh, the value you're giving versus just a little bit for everybody or just a couple dollars cheaper for everybody to really serve a family where it matters. And I'll end with this. It's 
I found this quote. I've been saying this for a while, but I found this quote from Mother Teresa. And she says, if you can't feed 100 people, feed just one. So you can't sell at a discount so that everybody can come to you. You're not Walmart. But you can't afford to just over deliver, over bless and over provide for one, then that's what you do. And, and that's the way you can live with yourself. That's the way you can feel good about the quality and the level at which you're serving other people. And um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I want to end there, but I want to encourage us to, let's not just do a little bit for everybody as we're raising prices, as we're marketing harder, we're sending more offers, but really go all in on and just blessing the socks off of one. What an amazing way to end, Jarrett. Um... It is so counterintuitive though, right? Like we think if we focus on the one, we are neglecting people and like, oh man, it like, it, and, I, and I get it. It causes us, maybe it reflects our, um, uh, our self-worth or our value or the way we perceive our self-worth when somebody unsubscribes. But um, marketing is actually pushing away the people that don't fit just as much as it is drawing in the people that do fit, right? That's right. Yep. And so that second email, so the one was the Friday, just to clarify, the other one was at the nine step. It's actually called the nine word email. Nine word so email. You don't have to make a whole email out of it. You just send these nine words and I recommend sending it once a month. And I'll include that in the docs that I get to you. Uh, and I'll put a little bit of, of an explainer. So in our program, obviously it's accompanied by a whole mm -hmm. video. But I'll just make this really easy. So all you guys need to do is copy and paste and fill in your information, and then you can hit send on one. So that is uh, very valuable. If you guys want more resources, again, nothing to really pitch here, but as, as it was said in the comments, I'd encourage you to join us at uh, Grassfed Marketing Secrets in our Facebook group. It's a private group, so you have to apply. But as you're filling out the membership questions, just be like, hey, I saw... Jared on Jared's uh, virtual summit, let me in and uh, drop your phone number in there. And then one of, one of our team members will hook you up with whatever resources you want or need. We got a lot. So um, just want to make sure you guys have everything you need. I'm sure I've raised more questions for you today than I've answered. And so we want to just make sure that you guys are getting everything you need to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's super awesome. Um, yeah. If you, why are, are you still game for a giveaway we talked about last night? Yes, sir. Okay. So we're thinking three one hour sessions with Jarrett where you just get laser focus dialed in and we get some answers. Um, just wondering, does, is anybody currently working with Jarrett and Cam in this group? Show of hands, raise of hands. Okay. So looks like just... Oh, we got Taylor. Yeah, type in the chat. Okay, Michelle. Awesome. Um, perfect. Very good. And so uh, I think you can attest to the value that's gained here. Um, just real quick, would what would either of you that is working on here, working with Cam and Jarrett, be willing to unmute and just kind of tell us your experience? Um, I, I can share just a little bit because I just have started sort of the introductions and met with Will and we're trying to figure out where to go next. But they're yeah. awesome. They're kind, they're gentle, and they're full of information, like lots of good information. Tell us a little bit more about what, what made you join and like, are you direct marketing grass-fed beef? And this is Michelle, right? Yes. Yes. Sorry, my windows are all open, so I'm kind of dark, but um we actually are a fourth generation or third generation. My kids are fourth on my family farm. And the reason I got into farming is because I really like the animals. And so we actually have the butcher come to our place. So our animals never have to leave okay. our farm. And so to me, it's like the kindest way that I can pay them back for what they're giving for us. Yeah. So grass fed is that. And we're in central Alberta between Calgary and Edmonton. They're both over a million people. Awesome. And so, yeah, tons of market there. I just have to figure out how to get into it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's pretty awesome. Thank you for being vulnerable and willing to jump on here with us all. We really appreciate that. And um, I know you'll you'll begin to see success immediately as you implement these. And that's kind of the what's neat is that it's a it's a system that's proven and you can um you know you just plug into it right it's uh, it, the mindset deal is one of those things that I, I think is our biggest hurdle hopefully we're helping with that in this class today because if you believe it'll work it will work you know and you'll and you'll keep going till it does work so so Jarrett let's um I think we'll do things just a little bit different here today Yesterday we did the um, uh, who can click the fastest and and that worked. I'm gonna do maybe a little more intuitive here. And so I'm gonna ask those of you who feel like this program would be a good fit for you, just go ahead and at any time raise your hand. It's not a first first one to that. So if you feel like, man, this is um, this is something that is really resonates it's something that i would like to do i would be all in i'm committed um raise your hand and then we'll just kind of see who who comes to mind here and also just kind of looking at um at what you guys do um i know a lot of you have been um uh, you know you you've been on the video you've been playing full out and uh it's not always easy let me while we're doing that while you're raising your hand ben offenberger are you able to unmute i just wanted to recognize you for just a minute while he's unmuting does everybody know how to raise their hand jared okay so down at the bottom if you're interested go to reactions and then click on that and just hit raise hand in reactions. Okay, Ben, looks like you're traveling. Looks like you got a good co-pilot there. Um, I, yeah. I, just, I just wanted to acknowledge you because um, I learned how to do this thing better so I can actually see your video and not just the presenter's video. So I'm, I'm spying on all you guys. I'm seeing who's nodding off here. No, you guys are doing good. Um, but tell us uh i mean i i saw you're in your office i saw you were in your barn i saw you were now driving somewhere um looks like you got family with you what uh what do you what do you do uh well right now we have a commercial cow calf herd and also do row crop and hay and some trucking on the side um so yeah i had you, know, you saw my wife at the end. I had her join for the marketing side of it because that's something that she would like to get into. And I got my dad to join me to listen to um, Steve and everything today. And I'm really glad I did. I'm going to try to get him to watch tomorrow, too, and probably buy the buy the recording so he can watch the first day, too, because I think he got a lot out of it, too. Yeah, awesome. So are you guys currently direct marketing? Or are you wanting to get into it? very very little direct marketing mainly will um kind of finish out things that are unsellable and and you know then we have them processed and sell them that way i guess that's all we do so far and i i don't know we'd like to get into it a little bit more um because we think that there's a good there's a good market for that and my wife's got a lot of connections in some bigger towns and stuff and a lot more people wanting you know the direct thing instead of going to the store so yeah <clears throat> well for some reason kind of spoke to me that maybe this would be a benefit to you guys do you feel like it would be i think so yeah okay so why don't we put them down Jarrett? um so ben offenberger and um i will let's see i'll make note of it also and then i'll share their contact information with you ben thank you for jumping on thank you for doing the best to be present and i again i i get it we're all busy people had to go People had to go plow snow and, you know, um, it's, uh, you're doing the best you can to be here. And I appreciate that. Um, all right. JR and Kara Jones, you guys had your hands up. Can you unmute and tell us a little bit about what you guys do? And are you currently direct marketing? Do you want to be? Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, um, we were the ones that asked the question if he worked with 
like registered grass-fed seed stock producers. We've got the email list built. I'm sporadic with my emails, could use help there. But our biggest problem is that it's not like the meat buyer who might come once a week or once a month. Um, we're selling to new people getting into the industry and they might come back three years later, they might come back five years later. Um, it, it's how to market to the right people at the right time and building more of those channels. Mm -hmm. so. you like, <laughs> the consistency is really what, what will build that out. And in any, in any industry, you, you really need to help them collapse that time frame down as a, as a sales cycle. And so that might mean introducing to, to them different resources to help them move quicker. Um, and in some cases, obviously that's not possible, but it's, they, in sales and marketing, they always say it's a numbers game. And that's because at any given time, there are people ready to move. And it's just that consistency of being there when they need you there. So I'd highly recommend a weekly email um, and I have some, some thoughts of how you can generate content for that as well. So, yep. One of the things we've done is we've taken our sales down to twice a year and their online auctions. So my marketing focus is mainly on people directing to our April and our October sales. Very good. That, <clears throat> so do you, the Joneses, do you feel like um, a strategy session with Jarrett would be of value? Oh, I learned a lot listening to him. I learned a lot. <laughs> learned a lot listening to him, especially about finding the, the customers. I think it'd be helpful, but I understand too, that we're not his main target audience, but I, I learned a lot from, from listening to him and I do think it'd be helpful. Okay, so does that work, Jared, if we make the Joneses prize winners number two? Absolutely. Looking okay, forward to you guys. AR and Kara Jones, and thanks you guys again for jumping on, for being part of the call. And I've seen you guys on the video all the time. Um, Thank and... you, our cows are part of Steve's presentation. <laughs> The good ones. <laughs> oh, wow. That says a lot. That says a lot. There's your best marketing right there. Okay. Um, Zach, can you unmute? Tell us about what you do. Uh, we do grass fed and finished beef. Um, in direct marketing, we have a USDA label and then uh, custom whole halves quarters. And we have been working with Barn to Door for about the last year, year and a half, but just not sure that that's the right tool for us. And we're just trying to get some better tools in the tool bag. And um, they've been good. It's you know still new for us, but think that we could do some things differently. We don't ship. Uh, we just mainly um, do stuff around local and um, sell to a, a school district here with the USDA side of it and then some stores. So um, there's definitely some questions that we have and barn to door has been good for us, but it's hard to get um, good solid answers. And it's, it, it seems like they're not necessarily uh, real one-on-one -on -one when you, when you need something, it seems like when you do talk to them that, they have a lot going on and, and it's, you know, it's kind of answer your questions and be done with it. So I think that uh, talking with uh, Jarrett would be really, really good and, and uh, much needed for us. Thank you for being assertive and say what you want. I like, <laughs> I like that. We don't have to talk you into doing it. You know what it is. So yeah, definitely. Let's have Zach be the, be another winner. Thank um, you. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. This this message is needed, and I'm grateful that this summit is able to bridge some of these gaps between those of us that are trying to get a product out there and those of us who have systems in place already. Um, I see Josh Ducart, but doesn't look like Josh has a hand raised. Can you unmute? Did you have a question, or are you interested in um, a one-on-one -on -one with Jarrett? Possibly. I'm Joshua's wife, uh, Tara, and. He had me at the wine cup ranch. You yes. guys did a presentation there a few, I don't know how long ago. It's a while ago, but it, yeah. yeah. So 
so he had, he brought his laptop up for me to listen to while I was actually working on beef customer invoices. And I really enjoyed the description of the customers with the names. I think that's hilarious. And as you were talking about them, I was identifying in my head, um, which person I was, and then which person a lot of my individual customers were. So I thought that was on point. And um, something that I want to be more intentional about, I think, is because we are working more toward okay, waste really bothers us. And so we want to educate our consumers about how, like when they turn down things like soup bone or organ meats um, and those things, oftentimes, if they're not intentionally saved, they just get discarded when we're talking about, because some of our beef we do um, direct to consumer, but in the form of quarters, halves and holes where it's a custom process, uh, but just I want to do a better job, I think, of educating our customers on the health benefits of the things that they're actually paying for, but might end up inevitably getting disposed. So um, I found just, yeah, the last hour that I tuned in here, the last however long it was, fascinating and very insightful and on point with the people description. And I just love that kind of psychology piece of it. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's good for me. And I'd like to, I think we'll buy this series too, so that we can re-listen and get connected um, the direct marketing is my piece of the ranch operation. And so this is in my wheelhouse and I have a passion for it. So I thought it was a really great presentation. Well, thank you for being on here. Jarrett, we've already given out three, but I mean, she seems pretty sincere. Like she might be somebody to take Let's action. See. I okay. had some ideas for her immediately. Well, so. I, did, I was just, I didn't know I was like raising my hand for a competition, but I, I appreciate oh. it. <laughs> I'm just interested in There's the no there's no accidents, Mrs. Ducart. <laughs> what a gracious winner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so we'll we'll put down and what was your first name? I'm Tara, T-A-R-A. Okay. So Josh and Tara Ducart. Um, and then I also saw another hand raised, Joanne. Um, do you want to unmute and tell us about what you do and Kind of, if you did have a, if you did have a question, if you're interested in um, visiting with Jarrett one on one or with somebody from the team, and we'll just yeah. So, so uh, my husband and I and our kids, we've been um, farming for a while, but we've been direct marketing for over ten years now. So doing whole halves and quarters, but doing it by the cut um, for the last ten years, and we've grown our business pretty large. We've put in a butcher shop on farm. Um, just to be able to get the consistency, but it feels like we've hit like a threshold where just getting, there's always ups and downs and we just need a nice consistency of getting our stuff out there all the time. Um, it's like, we're going great. And then boom, we hit like a, a bottom or something. So we're kind of in a bottom today. Um, we're, we know that it'll go up again, but just having that, when you were talking about consistency of sales and that um, predictable income um, through the month, and I'm thinking, oh, that would be fabulous. That's exactly what we need. So yes, it's definitely, um, because we've been at this for a while. I do the email marketing. I do a lot of stuff. I don't do everything perfect. I mean, I have a lot of improvement to do but I've been studying this for a while and I've, you know, we've had a good handle on things and I still feel like we need to, we need to do more. We need to make a next level. So yes. Do you know how many people are on your email list right now? We have, um, I think it's like 3,200. Okay. Nice. That have willingly signed up. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> are you guys shipping by chance? We are not shipping. Um, one restriction is that we are state inspected and not USDA inspected. Awesome. Where do you live? We, Indiana. Oh, hey. Hey, neighbor. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so Chicago, we have people drive from Chicago to the farm too. So yeah, that resonates. Yeah, yes. for sure. Okay, very cool. That's it. That's all I want to know. That's, okay. that's exciting. Thanks. Those are, those are great. That gave me some great thoughts. So thanks for sharing that. Thanks. So again, what do you, Jared do you, and, and Joanne, do you feel like connecting would be a good thing for you? Would it be, um, would it be valuable for each of you? Kind of, again, this is, this is more intuitive than it is yesterday. Just the first come first serve, because I, you know, I, I want to make these connections with this process. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, I mean, we would definitely be interested. I mean, we're always seeking to move forward. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Does that work? Jared, here I am committing your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're here to serve in any way. I know if, if Cam could have made it, he would be all over this too. So yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to see more of Joanne's business and see how we could help her with some things there. Very good. What's your last name, Joanne? It's Mosher, M-O-S-H-E-R. Okay, all right. And that's probably you. how you registered. Did you register under your name just so we can- um, I think so. Our farm is Holy Cow. <clears throat> okay, all right. All right, we'll make sure that we get all of you guys connected. Well, thank you. That really wasn't in the plans to spend that extra time. And I, I appreciate Jarrett staying on here to answer questions and- uh, yeah, we wholeheartedly endorse the grass-fed um, marketing secrets and grassfedmarketing.org. Uh, great people, people of high integrity. And so um, absolutely, absolutely endorse them and their mission to help family farms and ranches. So any parting words, Jarrett, and then we'll shut her down or give a reminder and then we'll shut her down for the day. No, I just want to say, you know, Jared, to you and Selena, thanks for doing this. It's very important um, work. We, we, you know, we see your content that you post quite a bit, super knowledgeable. You guys are solid people. And just as you endorse us, we love you. We, we support and endorse you as well. So thanks for putting this virtual summit on. I'm sure everyone that's attended has gotten just incredible uh, value from your time of investment and expertise. So thank you for serving farmers. You are very welcome. Yep. Thank you for being part of the mission of regeneration. And, and it is a, it is a mission. So just everybody, thank you for jumping on today. Still have 42 people here at the end. That's amazing. Um, I know it's taken, we've been here for four hours. We're like, you know, um, we're almost brothers and sisters here or something. By the end of this, we're going to know each other on a first name basis, but this has been, this has been really great. So tomorrow, same time, same Zoom link. I didn't get any messages today that anybody had trouble logging in. Um, I'm going to do my best. I have yesterday's Zoom recording uploaded to YouTube. So I'll get you that link right away and then get you today's as soon as it's available. I know there's been a lot of people asking about it and then we'll we'll figure out how to be able to make it available for lifetime to share. So I ask that you just keep that Zoom link. That's for those who've registered. I mean, the YouTube link, it's for those who registered for this. You know, don't, don't throw it out and share it with everybody. But um, yeah, it's for you guys. Definitely share it with your team, family members and things like that. You know, but I'm asking, well, I don't even know if it would work on social media because it's not a listed link on YouTube. Um, Nine o'clock Pacific time in the morning, we're going to hear from Wally Olson first thing. And then William DeMille. So while he's going to talk about sell by marketing, William's going to talk about with in high with all the inflation, high input costs, specifically fertilizer, how we can transition from a chemically dependent system to a biologically uh, thriving system so that we can wean ourselves off of synthetics and be more profitable. Um, and we can do that without crashing our production which is sometimes the uh, unintended consequences when you pull the plug like I did and just say no more chemicals, right? So we'll do it methodically. We'll do it without breaking your business and um, making it work for the biology of the soil, which is our greatest herd of livestock that we got to care for, right? So Steve, did you have a thought before we leave? I think you're muted, Steve. I'm sure it was profound what you were saying, but we can't read lips. Oh, I, I do have a thought, and, and I had mentioned linear measurement, and I guess, hey, Jared, it was it was awesome. I, I enjoyed, uh, again, I enjoyed your six descriptions, um, and I sold to all of them at one point or another over the course of 20 years. But what I wanted to say was, if you took the length of the animal from pin to pole versus the heart girth, right behind the front legs for each inch you add of heart girth you gain 37 pounds of red meat there are a lot of direct marketers on this call 
37 more pounds of meat to sell out of an animal uh, at no extra cost. As a matter of fact, less cost. In the feedlot, it was one less pound of grain to put on each one of those pounds of grain uh, gain. Um, that would be a lot more grass that you would save. But yeah, the, the shape of the animal, well, those bulls with vertical ribs are going to give you steers with a lot of heart girth. Those bull vertical ribs are gonna give you females with really wide butts. And so there's more meat in those animals. That's, so now we know how to sell it. Maybe that'll how help that. you create more meat. There we go. Yep, tomorrow we're gonna learn how to grow more grass to feed them. This is just gonna be a whole balance. We've worked on the mindset here. Thanks again for, for going maybe places that were a little bit uncomfortable today with Tyler and with Chris they're you know they're they're not they're not versed farmers or ranchers um, but they're people that I respect and that I've learned from and absolutely endorse because uh yeah we've got to get past our own roadblocks to be effective in whatever we do okay you guys we'll end this recording see you all tomorrow feel free to share this link with others um it is uh or the the sign up page we'd love to have more people on tomorrow take care all